Section One of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson. Section One On the Enjoyment of Unpleasant Places. It is a difficult matter to make the most of any given place, and we have much in our own power. Things looked at patiently from one side after another generally end by showing a side that is beautiful. A few months ago some words were said in the portfolio as to an austere regimen in scenery, and such a discipline was then recommended as healthful and strengthening to the taste. That is the text, so to speak, of the present essay. This discipline in scenery, it must be understood, is something more than a mere walk before breakfast to whet the appetite. For when we are put down in some unsightly neighbourhood, and especially if we have come to be more or less dependent on what we see, we must set ourselves to hunt out beautiful things with all the ardour and patience of a botanist after a rare plant. Day by day we perfect ourselves in the art of seeing nature more favourably. We learn to live with her, as people learn to live with fretful or violent spouses, to dwell lovingly on what is good and shut our eyes against all that is bleak or inharmonious. We learn also to come to each place in the right spirit. The traveller, as Brantome quaintly tells us, fait des discours en soi pour se soutenir en chemin and into these discourses he weaves something out of all that he sees and suffers by the way. They take their tone greatly from the varying character of the scene. A sharp ascent brings different thoughts from a level road, and the man's fancies grow lighter as he comes out of the wood into a clearing nor does the scenery any more affect the thoughts than the thoughts affect the scenery. We see places through our humours, as though differently coloured glasses. We are ourselves a term in the equation, a note of the chord, and make discord or harmony almost at will. There is no fear for the result if we can but surrender ourselves sufficiently to the country that surrounds and follows us, so that we are ever thinking suitable thoughts, or telling ourselves some suitable sort of story as we go. We become thus, in some sense, a centre of beauty. We are provocative of beauty, much as a gentle and sincere character is provocative of sincerity and gentleness in others. And even where there is no harmony to be elicited by the quickest and most obedient of spirits, we may still embellish a place with some attraction of romance. We may learn to go far afield for associations, and handle them lightly when we have found them. Sometimes an old print comes to our aid. 
i have seen many a spot lit up at once with picturesque imaginations by a reminiscence of callot or sadler or paul brill dick turpin has been my lay figure for many an english lane and i suppose the trossachs would hardly be the trossachs for most tourists if a man of admirable romantic instinct had not peopled it for them with harmonious figures and brought them thither their minds rightly prepared for the impression there is half the battle in this preparation for instance i have rarely been able to visit in the proper spirit the wild and inhospitable places of our own highlands i am happier where it is tame and fertile and not readily pleased without trees i understand that there are some phases of mental trouble that harmonize well with such surroundings and that some persons by the dispensing power of the imagination can go back several centuries in spirit and put themselves into sympathy with the hunted houseless unsociable way of life that was in its place upon these savage hills now when i am sad i like nature to charm me out of my sadness like david before saul and the thought of these past ages strikes nothing in me but an unpleasant pity so that i can never hit on the right humour for this sort of landscape and lose much pleasure in consequence still even here if i were only let alone and time enough were given i should have all manner of pleasure and take many clear and beautiful images away with me when i left when we cannot think ourselves into sympathy with the great features of a country we learn to ignore them and put our head among the grass for flowers or pour for long times together over the changeful current of a stream we come down to the sermon in stones when we are shut out from any poem in the spread landscape we begin to peep and botanize we take an interest in birds and insects we find many things beautiful in miniature the reader will recollect the little summer scene in wuthering heights the one warm scene perhaps in all that powerful miserable novel and the great feature that is made therein by grasses and flowers and a little sunshine this is in the spirit of which i now speak and lastly we can go indoors interiors are sometimes as beautiful often more picturesque than the shows of the open air and they have that quality of shelter of which i shall presently have more to say with all this in mind i have often been tempted to put forth the paradox that any place is good enough to live a life in while it is only in a few and those highly favoured that we can pass a few hours agreeably for if we only stay long enough we become at home in the neighbourhood reminiscences spring up like flowers about uninteresting corners we forget to some degree the superior loveliness of other places and fall into a tolerant and sympathetic spirit which is its own reward and justification 
Looking back the other day on some recollections of my own, I was astonished to find how much I owed to such a residence. Six weeks in one unpleasant countryside had done more, it seemed, to quicken and educate my sensibilities than many years in places that jumped more nearly with my inclination. The country to which I refer was a level and treeless plateau, over which the winds cut like a whip. For miles on miles it was the same. A river, indeed, fell into the sea near the town where I resided, but the valley of the river was shallow and bald, for as far up as ever I had the heart to follow it. There were roads, certainly, but roads that had no beauty or interest, for as there was no timber, and but little irregularity of surface, you saw your whole walk exposed to you from the beginning. There was nothing left to fancy, nothing to expect, nothing to see by the wayside, save here and there an unhomely-looking homestead, and here and there a solitary spectacled stone-breaker and you were only accompanied, as you went doggedly forward, by the gaunt telegraph-posts and the hum of the resonant wires in the keen sea-wind. To one who has learned to know their song in warm pleasant places by the Mediterranean, it seemed to taunt the country and make it still bleaker by suggested contrast. Even the waste places by the side of the road were not, as Hawthorne liked to put it, taken back to nature by any decent covering of vegetation. Wherever the land had the chance, it seemed to lie fallow. There is a certain tawny nudity of the south, bare sunburnt plains coloured like a lion, and hills clothed only in the blue transparent air. But this was of another description. This was the nakedness of the north. The earth seemed to know that it was naked and was ashamed and cold. It seemed to be always blowing on that coast. Indeed, this had passed into the speech of the inhabitants, and they saluted each other when they met with breezy, breezy, instead of the customary fine day of farther south. These continual winds were not like the harvest breeze that just keeps an equable pressure against your face as you walk, and serves to set all the trees talking over your head, or bring round you the smell of the wet surface of the country after a shower. They were of the bitter, hard, persistent sort that interferes with sight and respiration, and makes the eyes sore. Even such winds as these have their own merit in proper time and place. It is pleasant to see them brandish great masses of shadow, and what a power they have over the colour of the world! how they ruffle the solid woodlands in their passage, and make them shudder and whiten like a single willow. There is nothing more vertiginous than a wind like this among the woods, with all its sights and noises, and the effect gets between some painters and their sober eyesight, so that even when the rest of their picture is calm, 
the foliage is coloured like foliage in a gale there was nothing however of this sort to be noticed in a country where there were no trees and hardly any shadows save the passive shadows and clouds or those of rigid houses and walls but the wind was nevertheless an occasion of pleasure for nowhere could you taste more fully the pleasure of a sudden lull or a place of opportune shelter the reader knows what i mean he must remember how when he has sat himself down behind a dyke on a hillside he delighted to hear the wind hiss vainly through the crannies at his back how his body tingled all over with warmth and it began to dawn upon him with a sort of slow surprise that the country was beautiful the heather purple and the far-away hills all marbled with sun and shadow wordsworth in a beautiful passage of the prelude has used this as a figure for the feeling struck in us by the quiet by-streets of london after the uproar of the great thoroughfares and the comparison may be turned the other way with as good effect meanwhile the roar continues till at length escaped as from an enemy we turn abruptly into some sequestered nook still as a sheltered place when winds blow loud i remember meeting a man once in a train who told me of what must have been quite the most perfect instance of this pleasure of escape he had gone up one sunny windy morning to the top of a great cathedral somewhere abroad i think it was cologne cathedral the great unfinished marvel by the rhine and after a long while in dark stairways he issued at last into the sunshine on a platform high above the town at that elevation it was quite still and warm the gale was only in the lower strata of the air and he had forgotten it in the quiet interior of the church and during his long ascent and so you may judge of his surprise when resting his arms on the sunlit balustrade and looking over into the platz far below him he saw the good people holding on their hats and leaning hard against the wind as they walked there is something to my fancy quite perfect in this little experience of my fellow travellers the ways of men seem always very trivial to us when we find ourselves alone on a church top with the blue sky and a few tall pinnacles and see far below us the steep roofs and foreshortened buttresses and the silent activity of the city streets but how much more must they not have seemed so to him as he stood not only above other men's busyness but above other men's climate in a golden zone like apollo's this was the sort of pleasure i found in the country of which i write the pleasure was to be out of the wind and to keep it in memory all the time and hug oneself upon the shelter and it was only by the sea that any such sheltered places were to be found between the black worm-eaten headlands there are little bights and havens 
well screened from the wind and the commotion of the external sea where the sand and weeds look up into the gazer's face from a depth of tranquil water and the sea-birds screaming and flickering from the ruined crags alone disturb the silence and the sunshine one such place has impressed itself on my memory beyond all others on a rock by the water's edge old fighting men of the norse breed had planted a double castle the two stood wall to wall like semi-detached villas and yet feud had run so high between their owners that one from out of a window shot the other as he stood in his own doorway there is something in the juxtaposition of these two enemies full of tragic irony it is grim to think of bearded men and bitter women taking hateful counsel together about the two hall fires at night when the sea boomed against the foundations and the wild winter wind was loose over the battlements and in the study we may reconstruct for ourselves some pale figure of what life then was not so when we are there when we are there such thoughts come to us only to intensify a contrary impression and association is turned against itself i remember walking thither three afternoons in succession my eyes weary with being set against the wind and how dropping suddenly over the edge of the down i found myself in a new world of warmth and shelter the wind from which i had escaped as from an enemy was seemingly quite local it carried no clouds with it and came from such a quarter that it did not trouble the sea within view the two castles black and ruinous as the rocks about them were still distinguishable from these by something more insecure and fantastic in the outline something that the last storm had left imminent and the next would demolish entirely it would be difficult to render in words the sense of peace that took possession of me on these three afternoons it was helped out as i have said by the contrast the shore was battered and bemauled by previous tempests i had the memory at heart of the insane strife of the pygmies who had erected these two castles and lived in them in mutual distrust and enmity and knew i had only to put my head out of this little cup of shelter to find the hard wind blowing in my eyes and yet there were the two great tracts of motionless blue air and peaceful sea looking on unconcerned and apart at the turmoil of the present moment and the memorials of the precarious past there is ever something transitory and fretful in the impression of a high wind under a cloudless sky it seems to have no root in the constitution of things it must speedily begin to faint and wither away like a cut flower and on those days the thought of the wind and the thought of human life came very near together in my mind our noisy years 
did indeed seem moments in the being of the eternal silence and the wind in the face of that great field of stationary blue was as the wind of a butterfly's wing the placidity of the sea was a thing likewise to be remembered shelley speaks of the sea as hungering for calm and in this place one learned to understand the phrase looking down into these green waters from the broken edge of the rock or swimming leisurely in the sunshine it seemed to me that they were enjoying their own tranquillity and when now and again it was disturbed by a wind ripple on the surface or the quick black passage of a fish far below they settled back again one could fancy with relief on shore too in the little nook of shelter everything was so subdued and still that the least particular struck in me a pleasurable surprise the desultory crackling of the whin pods in the afternoon sun usurped the ear the hot sweet breath of the bank that had been saturated all day long with sunshine and now exhaled it into my face was like the breath of a fellow creature i remember that i was haunted by two lines of french verse in some dumb way they seemed to fit my surroundings and give expression to the contentment that was in me and i kept repeating to myself mon coeur est un lut suspendu sitôt qu'on le touche il résonne my heart is hung up like a lute at the first touch it resounds i can give no reason why these lines came to me at this time and for that very cause i repeat them here for all i know they may serve to complete the impression in the mind of the reader as they were certainly a part of it for me and this happened to me in the place of all others where i liked least to stay when i think of it i grow ashamed of my own ingratitude out of the strong came forth sweetness there in the bleak and gusty north i received perhaps my strongest impression of peace i saw the sea to be great and calm and the earth in that little corner was all alive and friendly to me so wherever a man is he will find something to please and pacify him in the town he will meet pleasant faces of men and women and see beautiful flowers at a window or hear a cage bird singing at the corner of the gloomiest street and for the country there is no country without some amenity let him only look for it in the right spirit and he will surely find end of section one recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey section two of essays of robert louis stevenson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson essays of robert louis stevenson section two an apology for idlers 
Boswell We grow weary when idle. Johnson That is, sir, because others being busy, we want company. But if we were idle, there would be no growing weary. We should all entertain one another. Just now, when everyone is bound, under pain of a decree in absence convicting them of lair's respectability, to enter on some lucrative profession, and labour therein with something not far short of enthusiasm, a cry from the opposite party, who are content when they have enough, and like to look on and enjoy in the meanwhile, save us a little of bravado and gasconade. And yet this should not be. Idleness, so called, which does not consist in doing nothing, but in doing a great deal not recognised in the dogmatic formularies of the ruling class, has as good a right to state its position as industry itself. It is admitted that the presence of people who refuse to enter in the great handicap race for sixpenny pieces is at once an insult and a disenchantment for those who do. A fine fellow, as we see so many, takes his determination, votes for the sixpences, and in the emphatic Americanism, goes for them. And while such an one is ploughing distressfully up the road, it is not hard to understand his resentment when he perceives cool persons in the meadows by the wayside, lying with a handkerchief over their ears and a glass at their elbow. Alexander is touched in a very delicate place by the disregard of Diogenes. Where was the glory of having taken Rome for these tumultuous barbarians who poured into the Senate House, and found the fathers sitting silent and unmoved by their success? It is a sore thing to have laboured along and scaled the arduous hilltops, and when all is done, find humanity indifferent to your achievement. Hence, physicists condemn the unphysical. Financiers have only a superficial toleration for those who know little of stocks. Literary persons despise the unlettered, and people of all pursuits combine to disparage those who have none. But though this is one difficulty of the subject, it is not the greatest. You could not be put in prison for speaking against industry but you can be sent to Coventry for speaking like a fool. The greatest difficulty with most subjects is to do them well. Therefore, please to remember this is an apology. It is certain that much may be judiciously argued in favour of diligence. Only there is something to be said against it, and that is what on the present occasion I have to say. To state one argument is not necessarily to be deaf to all others, and that a man has written a book of travels in Montenegro is no reason why he should never have been to Richmond. It is surely beyond a doubt that people should be a good deal idle in youth. For though here and there a Lord Macaulay may escape from school honours with all his wits about him, 
most boys pay so dear for their medals that they never afterwards have a shot in their locker and begin the world bankrupt and the same holds true during all the time a lad is educating himself or suffering others to educate him it must have been a very foolish old gentleman who addressed johnson at oxford in these words young man ply your book diligently now and acquire a stock of knowledge for when years come upon you you will find that poring upon books will be but an irksome task the old gentleman seems to have been unaware that many other things besides reading grow irksome and not a few become impossible by the time a man has to use spectacles and cannot walk without a stick books are good enough in their own way but they are a mighty bloodless substitute for life it seems a pity to sit like the lady of shalott peering into a mirror with your back turned on all the bustle and glamour of reality and if a man reads very hard as the old anecdote reminds us he will have little time for thoughts if you look back on your own education i am sure it will not be the full vivid instructive hours of truantry that you regret you would rather cancel some lack-lustre periods between sleep and waking in the class for my own part i have attended a good many lectures in my time i still remember that the spinning of a top is a case of kinetic stability i still remember that emphytusis is not a disease nor stillicide a crime but though i would not willingly part with such scraps of science i do not set the same store by them as by certain other odds and ends that i came by in the open street while i was playing truant this is not the moment to dilate on that mighty place of education which was the favourite school of dickens and of balzac and turns out yearly many inglorious masters in the science of the aspects of life suffice it to say this if a lad does not learn in the streets it is because he has no faculty of learning nor is the truant always in the streets for if he prefers he may go out by the gardened suburbs into the country he may pitch on some tuft of lilacs over a burn and smoke innumerable pipes to the tune of the water on the stones a bird will sing in the thicket and there he may fall into a vein of kindly thought and see things in a new perspective why if this be not education what is we may conceive mr worldly wise man accosting such an one and the conversation that should thereupon ensue how now young fellow what dost thou hear truly sir i take my knees is it not the hour of the class and shouldst thou not be plying thy book with diligence to the end thou mayest obtain knowledge nay but thus also i follow after learning by your leave learning quotha after what fashion i pray thee is it mathematics 
no to be sure is it metaphysics nor that is it some language nay it is no language is it a trade nor a trade neither why then what is't indeed sir as a time may soon come for me to go upon pilgrimage i am desirous to note what is commonly done by persons in my case and where are the ugliest sloughs and thickets on the road as also what manner of staff is of the best service moreover i lie here by this water to learn by root of heart a lesson which my master teaches me to call peace or contentment hereupon mr worldly wise man was much commoved with passion and shaking his cane with a very threatful countenance broke forth upon this wise learning quotha said he i would have all such rogues scourged by the hangman and so he would go his way ruffling out his cravat with a crackle of starch like a turkey when it spread its feathers now this of mr wise man is the common opinion a fact is not called a fact but a piece of gossip if it does not fall into one of your scholastic categories an inquiry must be in some acknowledged direction with a name to go by or else you are not inquiring at all only lounging and the workhouse is too good for you it is supposed that all knowledge is at the bottom of a well or the far end of a telescope saint beuve as he grew older came to regard all experience as a single great book in which to study for a few years ere we go hence and it seemed all one to him whether you should read in chapter twenty which is the differential calculus or in chapter thirty nine which is hearing the band play in the gardens as a matter of fact an intelligent person looking out of his eyes and hearkening in his ears with a smile on his face all the time will get more true education than many another in a life of heroic vigils there is certainly some chill and arid knowledge to be found upon the summits of formal and laborious science but it is all round about you and for the trouble of looking that you will acquire the warm and palpitating facts of life while others are filling their memory with a lumber of words one half of which they will forget before the week be out your truant may learn some really useful art to play the fiddle to know a good cigar or to speak with ease and opportunity to all varieties of men many who have plied their book diligently and know all about some one branch or another of accepted law come out of the study with an ancient and owl-like demeanour and prove dry stockish and dyspeptic in all the better and brighter parts of life many make a large fortune who remain underbred and pathetically stupid to the last and meantime there goes the idler who began life along with them by your leave a different picture he has had time to take care of his health and his spirits 
he has been a great deal in the open air which is the most salutary of all things for both body and mind and if he has never read the great book in very recondite places he has dipped into it and skimmed it over to excellent purpose might not the student afford some hebrew roots and the businessman some of his half-crowns for a share of the idler's knowledge of life at large and art of living nay and the idler has another and more important quality than these i mean his wisdom he who has much looked on at the childish satisfaction of other people in their hobbies will regard his own with only a very ironical indulgence he will not be heard among the dogmatists he will have a great and cool allowance for all sorts of people and opinions if he finds no out-of-the-way truths he will identify himself with no very burning falsehood his way took him along a by-road not much frequented but very even and pleasant which is called commonplace lane and leads to the belvedere of common sense thence he shall command an agreeable if no very noble prospect and while others behold the east and west the devil and the sunrise he will be contentedly aware of a sort of morning hour upon all sublunary things with an army of shadows running speedily and in many different directions into the great daylight of eternity the shadows and the generations the shrill doctors and the plangent wars go by into ultimate silence and emptiness but underneath all this a man may see out of the belvedere windows much green and peaceful landscape many firelit parlours good people laughing drinking and making love as they did before the flood or the french revolution and the old shepherd telling his tale under the hawthorn extreme busyness whether at school or college kirk or market is a symptom of deficient vitality and a faculty for idleness implies a catholic appetite and a strong sense of personal identity there is a sort of dead alive hackneyed people about who are scarcely conscious of living except in the exercise of some conventional occupation bring these fellows into the country or set them aboard ship and you will see how they pine for their desk or their study they have no curiosity they cannot give themselves over to random provocations they do not take pleasure in the exercise of their faculties for its own sake and unless necessity lays about them with a stick they will even stand still it is no good speaking to such folk they cannot be idle their nature is not generous enough and they pass those hours in a sort of coma which are not dedicated to furious moiling in the gold mill when they do not require to go to the office when they are not hungry and have no mind to drink the whole breathing world is a blank to them if they have to wait an hour or so for a train they fall into a stupid
trance with their eyes open to see them you would suppose there was nothing to look at and no one to speak with you would imagine they were paralyzed or alienated and yet very possibly they are hard workers in their own way and have good eyesight for a flaw in a deed or a turn of the market they have been to school and college but all the time they had their eye on the medal they have gone about in the world and mixed with clever people but all the time they were thinking of their own affairs as if a man's soul were not too small to begin with they have dwarfed and narrowed theirs by a life of all work and no play until here they are at forty with a listless attention a mind vacant of all material of amusement and not one thought to rub against another while they wait for the train before he was breached he might have clambered on the boxes when he was twenty he would have stared at the girls but now the pipe is smoked out the snuff-box empty and my gentleman sits bolt upright upon a bench with lamentable eyes this does not appeal to me as being success in life but it is not only the person himself who suffers from his busy habits but his wife and children his friends and relations and down to the very people he sits with in a railway carriage or an omnibus perpetual devotion to what a man calls his business is only to be sustained by perpetual neglect of many other things and it is not by any means certain that a man's business is the most important thing he has to do to an impartial estimate it will seem clear that many of the wisest most virtuous and most beneficent parts that are to be played upon the theatre of life are filled by gratuitous performers and pass among the world at large as phases of idleness for in that theatre not only the walking gentlemen singing chambermaids and diligent fiddlers in the orchestra but those who look on and clap their hands from the benches do really play a part and fulfil important offices towards the general result you are no doubt very dependent on the care of your lawyer and stockbroker of the guards and signalmen who convey you rapidly from place to place and the policemen who walk the streets for your protection but is there not a thought of gratitude in your heart for certain other benefactors who set you smiling when they fall in your way or season your dinner with good company Colonel Newcombe helped to lose his friend's money. Fred Bayham had an ugly trick of borrowing shirts, and yet they were better people to fall among than Mr. Barnes. And though Falstaff was neither sober nor very honest, I think I could name one or two long-faced Barabbases whom the world could better have done without hazlitt mentions that he was more sensible of obligation to northcote who had never done him anything he could call a service than to his whole circle of ostentatious friends for he thought a good companion emphatically the greatest benefactor 
i know there are people in the world who cannot feel grateful unless the favour has been done them at the cost of pain and difficulty but this is a churlish disposition a man may send you six sheets of letter-paper covered with the most entertaining gossip or you may pass half an hour pleasantly perhaps profitably over an article of his do you think the service would be greater if he had made the manuscript in his heart's blood like a compact with the devil do you really fancy you should be more beholden to your correspondent if he had been damning you all the while for your importunity pleasures are more beneficial than duties because like the quality of mercy they are not strained and they are twice blessed there must always be two to a kiss and there may be a score in a jest but wherever there is an element of sacrifice the favour is conferred with pain and among generous people received with confusion there is no duty we so much underrate as the duty of being happy by being happy we sow anonymous benefits upon the world which remain unknown even to ourselves or when they are disclosed surprise nobody so much as the benefactor the other day a ragged barefoot boy ran down the street after a marble with so jolly an air that he set every one he passed into a good humour one of these persons who had been delivered from more than usually black thoughts stopped the little fellow and gave him some money with this remark you see what sometimes comes of looking pleased if he had looked pleased before he had now to look both pleased and mystified for my part i justify this encouragement of smiling rather than tearful children i do not wish to pay for tears anywhere but upon the stage but i am prepared to deal largely in the opposite commodity a happy man or woman is a better thing to find than a five-pound note he or she is a radiating focus of good will and their entrance into a room is as though another candle had been lighted we need not care whether they could prove the forty-seventh proposition they do a better thing than that they practically demonstrate the great theorem of the livableness of life consequently if a person cannot be happy without remaining idle idle he should remain it is a revolutionary precept but thanks to hunger and the workhouse one not easily to be abused and within practical limits it is one of the most incontestable truths in the whole body of morality look at one of your industrious fellows for a moment i beseech you he sows hurry and reaps indigestion he puts a vast deal of activity out to interest and receives a large measure of nervous derangement in return either he absents himself entirely from all fellowship and lives a recluse in a garret with carpet slippers and a leaden ink-pot or he comes among people swiftly and bitterly 
in a contraction of his whole nervous system to discharge some temper before he returns to work i do not care how much or how well he works this fellow is an evil feature in other people's lives they would be happier if he were dead they could easier do without his services in the circumlocution office than they can tolerate his fractious spirits he poisons life at the well-head it is better to be beggared out of hand by a scapegrace nephew than daily hag-ridden by a peevish uncle and what in god's name is all this pother about for what cause do they embitter their own and other people's lives that a man should publish three or thirty articles a year that he should finish or not finish his great allegorical picture are questions of little interest to the world the ranks of life are full and although a thousand fall there are always some to go into the breach when they told joan of arc she should be at home minding women's work she answered there were plenty to spin and wash and so even with your own rare gifts when nature is so careless of the single life why should we coddle ourselves into the fancy that our own is of exceptional importance suppose shakespeare had been knocked on the head some dark night in sir thomas lucy's preserves the world would have wagged on better or worse the pitcher gone to the well the scythe to the corn and the student to his book and no one been any the wiser of the loss there are not many works extant if you look the alternative all over which are worth the price of a pound of tobacco to a man of limited means this is a sobering reflection for the proudest of our earthly vanities even a tobacconist may upon consideration find no great cause for personal vainglory in the phrase for although tobacco is an admirable sedative the qualities necessary for retailing it are neither rare nor precious in themselves alas and alas you may take it how you will but the services of no single individual are indispensable atlas was just a gentleman with a protracted nightmare and yet you see merchants who go and labour themselves into a great fortune and thence into bankruptcy court scribblers who keep scribbling at little articles until their temper is a cross to all who come about them as though pharaoh should set the israelites to make a pin instead of a pyramid and fine young men who work themselves into a decline and are driven off in a hearse with white plumes upon it would you not suppose these persons had been whispered by the master of the ceremonies the promise of some momentous destiny and that this lukewarm bullet on which they play their farces was the bull's eye and centre point of all the universe and yet it is not so the ends for which they gave away their priceless youth for all they know may be chimerical or hurtful 
the glory and riches they expect may never come or may find them indifferent and they and the world they inhabit are so inconsiderable that the mind freezes at the thought end of section 2 recording Section 3 of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson Section 3 Eyes Triplex Triple Brass the changes wrought by death are in themselves so sharp and final and so terrible and melancholy in their consequences that the thing stands alone in man's experience and has no parallel upon earth it outdoes all other accidents because it is the last of them sometimes it leaps suddenly upon its victims like a thug sometimes it lays a regular siege and creeps upon their citadel during a score of years and when the business is done there is sore havoc made in other people's lives and a pin knocked out by which many subsidiary friendships hung together there are empty chairs solitary walks and single beds at night again in taking away our friends death does not take them away utterly but leaves behind a mocking tragical and soon intolerable residue which must be hurriedly concealed. Hence a whole chapter of sights and customs striking to the mind, from the pyramids of Egypt to the gibbets and dual trees of medieval Europe. The poorest persons have a bit of pageant going towards the tomb memorial stones are set up over the least memorable and in order to preserve some show of respect for what remains of our old loves and friendships we must accompany it with much grimly ludicrous ceremonial and the hired undertaker parades before the door all this and much more of the same sort accompanied by the eloquence of poets has gone a great way to put humanity in error nay in many philosophies the error has been embodied and laid down with every circumstance of logic although in real life the bustle and swiftness in leaving people little time to think have not left them time enough to go dangerously wrong in practice. As a matter of fact, although few things are spoken of with more fearful whisperings than this prospect of death, few have less influence on conduct under healthy circumstances. We have all heard of cities in South America built upon the side of fiery mountains and how even in this tremendous neighbourhood the inhabitants are not a jot more impressed by the solemnity of mortal conditions than if they were delving gardens in the greenest corner of england 
there are serenades and suppers and much gallantry among the myrtles overhead and meanwhile the foundation shudders underfoot the bowels of the mountain growl and at any moment living ruin may leap sky-high into the moonlight and tumble man and his merry-making in the dust in the eyes of very young people and very dull old ones there is something indescribably reckless and desperate in such a picture it seems not credible that respectable married people with umbrellas should find appetite for a bit of supper within quite a long distance of a fiery mountain ordinary life begins to smell of high-handed debauch when it is carried on so close to a catastrophe and even cheese and salad it seems could hardly be relished in such circumstances without something like a defiance of the creator it should be a place for nobody but hermits dwelling in prayer and maceration or mere born devils drowning care in a perpetual carouse and yet when one comes to think upon it calmly the situation of these south american citizens forms only a very pale figure for the state of ordinary mankind this world itself travelling blindly and swiftly in overcrowded space among a million other worlds travelling blindly and swiftly in contrary directions may very well come by a knock that would set it into explosion like a penny squib and what pathologically looked at is the human body with all its organs but a mere bagful of petards the least of these is as dangerous to the whole economy as the ship's powder magazine to the ship and with every breath we breathe and every meal we eat we are putting one or more of them in peril if we clung as devotedly as some philosophers pretend we do to the abstract idea of life or were half as frightened as they make out we are for the subversive accident that ends it all the trumpets might sound by the hour and no one would follow them into battle the blue peter might fly at the truck but who would climb into a sea-going ship think if these philosophers were right with what a preparation of spirit we should affront the daily peril of the dinner-table a deadlier spot than any battlefield in history where the far greater proportion of our ancestors have miserably left their bones what woman would ever be lured into marriage so much more dangerous than the wildest sea and what would it be to grow old for after a certain distance every step we take in life we find the ice growing thinner below our feet and all around us and behind us we see our contemporaries going through by the time a man gets well into the seventies his continued existence is a mere miracle and when he lays his old bones in bed for the night there is an overwhelming probability that he will never see the day do the old men mind it as a matter of fact why no they were never merrier 
they have their grog at night and tell the raciest stories they hear of the death of people about their own age or even younger not as if it was a grisly warning but with a simple childlike pleasure at having outlived someone else and when a draught might puff them out like a fluttering candle or a bit of a stumble shatter them like so much glass their old hearts keep sound and unaffrighted and they go on bubbling with laughter through years of man's age compared to which the valley at balaclava was as safe and peaceful as a village cricket green on sunday it may fairly be questioned if we look to the peril only whether it was a much more daring feat for courtius to plunge into the gulf than for any old gentleman of ninety to doff his clothes and clamber into bed indeed it is a memorable subject for consideration with what unconcern and gaiety mankind pricks on along the valley of the shadow of death the whole way is one wilderness of snares and the end of it for those who fear the last pinch is irrevocable ruin and yet we go spinning through it all like a party for the derby perhaps the reader remembers one of the humorous devices of the deified caligula how he encouraged a vast concourse of holiday-makers on to his bridge over Bayai Bay, and when they were in the height of their enjoyment, turned loose the Praetorian guards among the company, and had them tossed into the sea. This is no bad miniature of the dealings of nature with the transitory race of man. Only what a chequered picnic we have of it, even while it lasts, and into what great waters, not to be crossed by any swimmer, God's pale Praetorian throws us over in the end we live the time that a match flickers we pop the cork of a ginger beer bottle and the earthquake swallows us on the instant is it not odd is it not incongruous is it not in the highest sense of human speech incredible that we should think so highly of the ginger beer and regard so little the devouring earthquake the love of life and the fear of death are two famous phrases that grow harder to understand the more we think about them it is a well-known fact that an immense proportion of boat accidents would never happen if people held the sheet in their hands instead of making it fast and yet unless it be some martinet of a professional mariner or some landsman with shattered nerves every one of god's creatures makes it fast a strange instance of man's unconcern and brazen boldness in the face of death we confound ourselves with metaphysical phrases which we import into daily talk with noble inappropriateness we have no idea of what death is apart from its circumstances and some of its consequences to others and although we have some experience of living 
there is not a man on earth who has flown so high into abstraction as to have any practical guess at the meaning of the word life all literature from job and omar khayyam to thomas carlyle or walt whitman is but an attempt to look upon the human state with such largeness of view as shall enable us to rise from the consideration of living to the definition of life and our sages give us about the best satisfaction in their power when they say that it is a vapour or a show or made out of the same stuff with dreams philosophy in its more rigid sense has been at the same work for ages and after a myriad bald heads have wagged over the problem and piles of words have been heaped one upon another into dry and cloudy volumes without end philosophy has the honour of laying before us with modest pride her contribution towards the subject that life is a permanent possibility of sensation truly a fine result a man may very well love beef or hunting or a woman but surely surely not a permanent possibility of sensation he may be afraid of a precipice or a dentist or a large enemy with a club or even an undertaker's man but not certainly of abstract death we may trick with the word life in its dozen senses until we are weary of tricking we may argue in terms of all the philosophies on earth but one fact remains true throughout that we do not love life in the sense that we are greatly preoccupied about its conservation that we do not properly speaking love life at all but living into the views of the least careful there will enter some degree of providence no man's eyes are fixed entirely on the passing hour but although we have some anticipation of good health good weather wine active employment love and self-approval the sum of these anticipations does not amount to anything like a general view of life's possibilities and issues nor are those who cherish them most vividly at all the most scrupulous of their personal safety to be deeply interested in the accidents of our existence to enjoy keenly the mixed texture of human experience rather leads a man to disregard precautions and risk his neck against a straw for surely the love of living is stronger in an alpine climber roping over a peril or a hunter riding merrily at a stiff fence than in a creature who lives upon a diet and walks a measured distance in the interest of his constitution there is a very great deal of very vile nonsense talked upon both sides of the matter tearing divines reducing life to the dimensions of a mere funeral procession so short as to be hardly decent and melancholy unbelievers yearning for the tomb as if it were a world too far away both sides must feel a little ashamed of their performances now and again 
when they draw in their chairs to dinner indeed a good meal and a bottle of wine is an answer to most standard works upon the question when a man's heart warms to his viands he forgets a great deal of sophistry and soars into a rosy zone of contemplation death may be knocking at the door like the commander's statue we have something else in hand thank god and let him knock passing bells are ringing all the world over all the world over and every hour someone is parting company with all his aches and ecstasies for us also the trap is laid but we are so fond of life that we have no leisure to entertain the terror of death it is a honeymoon with us all through and none of the longest small blame to us if we give our whole hearts to this glowing bride of ours to the appetites to honour to the hungry curiosity of the mind to the pleasure of the eyes in nature and the pride of our own nimble bodies we all of us appreciate the sensations but as for caring about the permanence of the possibility a man's head is generally very bald and his senses very dull before he comes to that whether we regard life as a lane leading to a dead wall a mere bag's end as the french say or whether we think of it as a vestibule or gymnasium where we wait our turn and prepare our faculties for some more noble destiny whether we thunder in a pulpit or pule in little atheistic poetry books about its vanity and brevity whether we look justly for years of health and vigour or are about to mount into a bath chair as a step towards the hearse in each and all of these views and situations there is but one conclusion possible that a man should stop his ears against paralyzing terror and run the race that is set before him with a single mind no one surely could have recoiled with more heartache and terror from the thought of death than our respected lexicographer and yet we know how little it affected his conduct how wisely and boldly he walked and in what a fresh and lively vein he spoke of life already an old man he ventured on his highland tour and his heart bound with triple brass did not recoil before twenty-seven individual cups of tea as courage and intelligence are the two qualities best worth a good man's cultivation so it is the first part of intelligence to recognize our precarious estate in life and the first part of courage to be not at all abashed before the fact a frank and somewhat headlong carriage not looking too anxiously before not dallying in maudlin regret over the past stamps the man who is well armoured for this world and not only well armoured for himself but a good friend and a good citizen to boot we do not go to cowards for tender dealing 
there is nothing so cruel as panic the man who has least fear for his own carcass has most time to consider others that eminent chemist who took his walks abroad in tin shoes and subsisted wholly upon tepid milk had all his work cut out for him in considerate dealings with his own digestion so soon as prudence has begun to grow up in the brain like a dismal fungus it finds its first expression in a paralysis of generous acts the victim begins to shrink spiritually he develops a fancy for parlours with a regulated temperature and takes his morality on the principle of tin shoes and tepid milk the care of one important body or soul becomes so engrossing that all the noises of the outer world begin to come thin and faint into the parlour with the regulated temperature and the tin shoes go equably forward over blood and rain to be over wise is to ossify and the scruple-monger ends by standing stock still now the man who has his heart on his sleeve and a good whirling weathercock of a brain who reckons his life as a thing to be dashingly used and cheerfully hazarded makes a very different acquaintance of the world keeps all his pulses going true and fast and gathers impetus as he runs until if he be running towards anything better than wildfire he may shoot up and become a constellation in the end lord look after his health lord have a care of his soul says he and he has at the key of the position and swashes through incongruity and peril towards his aim death is on all sides of him with pointed batteries as he is on all sides of all of us unfortunate surprises gird him round mim-mouthed friends and relations hold up their hands in quite a little elegiacal synod about his path and what cares he for all this being a true lover of living a fellow with something pushing and spontaneous in his inside he must like any other soldier in any other stirring deadly warfare push on at his best pace until he touch the goal a peerage or westminster abbey cried nelson in his bright boyish heroic manner these are great incentives not for any of these but for the plain satisfaction of living of being about their business in some sort or other do the brave serviceable men of every nation tread down the nettle danger and pass flyingly over all the stumbling blocks of prudence think of the heroism of johnson think of that superb indifference to mortal limitation that set him upon his dictionary and carried him through triumphantly until the end who if he were wisely considerate of things at large would ever embark upon any work much more considerable than a halfpenny postcard who would project a serial novel after thackeray and dickens had each fallen in mid-course 
who would find heart enough to begin to live if he dallied with the consideration of death and after all what sorry and pitiful quibbling all this is to forego all the issues of living in a parlour with a regulated temperature as if that were not to die a hundred times over and for ten years at a stretch as if it were not to die in one's own lifetime and without even the sad immunities of death as if it were not to die and yet be the patient spectators of our own pitiable change the permanent possibility is preserved but the sensations carefully held at arm's length as if one kept a photographic plate in a dark chamber it is better to lose health like a spendthrift than to waste it like a miser it is better to live and be done with it than to die daily in the sick-room by all means begin your folio even if the doctor does not give you a year even if he hesitates about a month make one brave push and see what can be accomplished in a week it is not only in finished undertakings that we ought to honour useful labour a spirit goes out of the man who means execution which outlives the most untimely ending all who have meant good work with their whole hearts have done good work although they may die before they have the time to sign it every heart that has beat strong and cheerfully has left a hopeful impulse behind it in the world and bettered the tradition of mankind and even if death catch people like an open pitfall and in mid-career laying out vast projects and planning monstrous foundations flushed with hope and their mouths full of boastful language they should be at once tripped up and silenced is there not something brave and spirited in such a termination and does not life go down with a better grace foaming in full body over a precipice than miserably straggling to an end in sandy deltas when the greeks made their fine saying that those whom the gods love die young i cannot help believing they had this sort of death also in their eye for surely at whatever age it overtake the man this is to die young death has not been suffered to take so much as an illusion from his heart in the hot fit of life a tiptoe on the highest point of being he passes at a bound on to the other side the noise of the mallet and chisel is scarcely quenched the trumpets are hardly done blowing when trailing with him clouds of glory this happy starred full-blooded spirit shoots into the spiritual land End of section three. Recording by Section four of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. 
Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson Section 4 Talk and Talkers Part 1 Sir, we had a good talk. Johnson As we must account for every idle word, so we must for every idle silence. Franklin there can be no fairer ambition than to excel in talk to be affable gay ready clear and welcome to have a fact a thought or an illustration pat to every subject and not only to cheer the flight of time among our intimates but bear our part in that great international congress always sitting where public wrongs are first declared public errors first corrected and the course of public opinion shaped day by day a little nearer to the right no measure comes before parliament but it has been long ago prepared by the grand jury of the talkers no book is written that has not been largely composed by their assistance literature in many of its branches is no other than the shadow of good talk but the imitation falls far short of the original in life freedom and effect there are always two to a talk giving and taking comparing experience and according conclusions talk is fluid tentative continually in further search and progress while written words remain fixed become idols even to the writer found wooden dogmatisms and preserve flies of obvious error in the amber of the truth last and chief while literature gagged with linsey woolsey can only deal with a fraction of the life of man talk goes fancy free and may call a spade a spade it cannot even if it would become merely aesthetic or merely classical like literature a jest intervenes the solemn humbug is dissolved in laughter and speech runs forth out of the contemporary groove into the open fields of nature cheery and cheering like schoolboys out of school and it is in talk alone that we can learn our period and ourselves in short the first duty of a man is to speak that is his chief business in this world and talk which is the harmonious speech of two or more is by far the most accessible of pleasures it costs nothing in money it is all profit it completes our education founds and fosters our friendships and can be enjoyed at any age and in almost any state of health the spice of life is battle the friendliest relations are still a kind of contest and if we would not forego all that is valuable in our lot we must continually face some other person eye to eye and wrestle a fall whether in love or enmity it is still by force of body or power of character or intellect that we attain to worthy pleasures men and women contend for each other in the lists of love like rival mesmerists 
the active and adroit decide their challenges in the sports of the body and the sedentary sit down to chess or conversation all sluggish and pacific pleasures are to the same degree solitary and selfish and every durable bond between human beings is founded in or heightened by some element of competition now the relation that has the least root in matter is undoubtedly that airy one of friendship and hence i suppose it is that good talk most commonly arises among friends talk is indeed both the scene and instrument of friendship it is in talk alone that the friends can measure strength and enjoy that amicable counter-assertion of personality which is the gauge of relations and the sport of life a good talk is not to be had for the asking humours must first be accorded in a kind of overture or prologue hour company and circumstance be suited and then at a fit juncture the subject the quarry of two heated minds spring up like a deer out of the wood not that the talker has any of the hunter's pride though he has all and more than all his ardour the genuine artist follows the stream of conversation as an angler follows the windings of a brook not dallying where he fails to kill he trusts implicitly to hazard and he is rewarded by continual variety continual pleasure and those changing prospects of the truth that are the best of education there is nothing in a subject so called that we should regard it as an idol or follow it beyond the promptings of desire indeed there are few subjects and so far as they are truly talkable more than the half of them may be reduced to three that i am i that you are you and that there are other people dimly understood to be not quite the same as either wherever talk may range it still runs half the time on these eternal lines the theme being set each plays on himself as on an instrument asserts and justifies himself ransacks his brain for instances and opinions and brings them forth new minted to his own surprise and the admiration of his adversary all natural talk is a festival of ostentation and by the laws of the game each accepts and fans the vanity of the other it is from that reason that we venture to lay ourselves so open that we dare to be so warmly eloquent and that we swell in each other's eyes to such a vast proportion for talkers once launched begin to overflow the limits of their ordinary selves tower up to the height of their secret pretensions and give themselves out for the heroes brave pious musical and wise that in their most shining moments they aspire to be so they weave for themselves with words and for a while inhabit a palace of delights temple at once and theatre where they fill the round of the world's dignities and feast with the gods 
exulting in kudos and when the talk is over each goes his way still flushed with vanity and admiration still trailing clouds of glory each declines from the height of his ideal orgie not in a moment but by slow declension i remember in the entr'acte of an afternoon performance coming forth into the sunshine in a beautiful green gardened corner of a romantic city and as i sat and smoked the music moving in my blood i seemed to sit there and evaporate the flying dutchman for it was that i had been hearing with a wonderful sense of life warmth well-being and pride and the noises of the city voices bells and marching feet fell together in my ears like a symphonious orchestra in the same way the excitement of a good talk lives for a long while after in the blood the heart still hot within you the brain still simmering and the physical earth swimming around you with the colours of the sunset natural talk like ploughing should turn up a large surface of life rather than dig mines into geological strata masses of experience anecdote incident cross-lights quotation historical instances the whole flotsam and jetsam of two minds forced in and in upon the matter in hand from every point of the compass and from every degree of mental elevation and abasement these are the material with which talk is fortified the food on which the talkers thrive such argument as is proper to the exercise should still be brief and seizing talk should proceed by instances by the apposite not the expository it should keep close along the lines of humanity near the bosoms and businesses of men at the level where history fiction and experience intersect and illuminate each other i am i and you are you with all my heart but conceive how these lean propositions change and brighten when instead of words the actual you and i sit cheek by jowl the spirit housed in the live body and the very clothes uttering voices to corroborate the story in the face not less surprising is the change when we leave off to speak of generalities the bad the good the miser and all the characters of theophrastus and call up other men by anecdote or instance in their very trick and feature or trading on a common knowledge toss each other famous names still glowing with the hues of life communication is no longer by words but by the instancing of whole biographies epics systems of philosophy and epochs of history in bulk that which is understood excels that which is spoken in quantity and quality alike ideas thus figured and personified change hands as we may say like coin and the speakers imply without effort the most obscure and intricate thoughts 
strangers who have a large common ground of reading will for this reason come the sooner to the grapple of genuine converse if they know othello and napoleon consuelo and clarissa harlowe vautrin steeny steenson they can leave generalities and begin at once to speak by figures conduct and art are the two subjects that arise most frequently and that embrace the widest range of facts a few pleasures bear discussion for their own sake but only those which are most social or most radically human and even these can only be discussed among their devotees a technicality is always welcome to the expert whether in athletics art or law i have heard the best kind of talk on technicalities from such rare and happy persons as both know and love their business no human being ever spoke of scenery for above two minutes at a time which makes me suspect we hear too much of it in literature the weather is regarded as the very nadir and scoff of conversational topics and yet the weather the dramatic element in scenery is far more tractable in language and far more human both in import and suggestion than the stable features of the landscape sailors and shepherds and the people generally of coast and mountain talk well of it and it is often excitingly presented in literature but the tendency of all living talk draws it back and back into the common focus of humanity talk is a creature of the street and market-place feeding on gossip and its last resort is still in a discussion on morals that is the heroic form of gossip heroic in virtue of its high pretensions but still gossip because it turns on personalities you can keep no men long nor scotchmen at all off moral or theological discussion these are to all the world what law is to lawyers they are everybody's technicalities the medium through which all consider life and the dialect in which they express their judgments i knew three young men who walked together daily for some two months in a solemn and beautiful forest and in cloudless summer weather daily they talked with unabated zest and yet scarce wandered that whole time beyond two subjects theology and love and perhaps neither a court of love nor an assembly of divines would have granted their premises or welcomed their conclusions conclusions indeed are not often reached by talk any more than by private thinking that is not the profit the profit is in the exercise and above all in the experience for when we reason at large on any subject we review our state and history in life from time to time however and specially i think in talking art talk becomes effective conquering like war widening the boundaries of knowledge like an exploration a point arises the question takes a problematical a baffling yet a likely air 
the talkers begin to feel lively presentiments of some conclusion near at hand towards this they strive with emulous ardour each by his own path and struggling for first utterance and then one leaps upon the summit of that matter with a shout and almost at the same moment the other is beside him and behold they are agreed like enough the progress is illusory a mere cat's cradle having been wound and unwound out of words but the sense of joint discovery is none the less giddy and inspiring and in the life of the talker such triumphs though imaginary are neither few nor far apart they are attained with speed and pleasure in the hour of mirth and by the nature of the process they are always worthily shared there is a certain attitude combative at once and deferential eager to fight yet most averse to quarrel which marks out at once the talkable man it is not eloquence not fairness not obstinacy but a certain proportion of all of these that i love to encounter in my amicable adversaries they must not be pontiffs holding doctrine but huntsmen questing after elements of truth neither must they be boys to be instructed but fellow teachers with whom i may wrangle and agree on equal terms we must reach some solution some shadow of consent for without that eager talk becomes a torture but we do not wish to reach it cheaply or quickly or without the tussle and effort wherein pleasure lies the very best talker with me is one whom i shall call spring-heeled jack i say so because i never knew any one who mingled so largely the possible ingredients of converse in the spanish proverb the fourth man necessary to compound a salad is a madman to mix it jack is that madman i know not what is more remarkable the insane lucidity of his conclusions the humorous eloquence of his language or his power of method bringing the whole of life into the focus of the subject treated mixing the conversational salad like a drunken god he doubles like the serpent changes and flashes like the shaken kaleidoscope transmigrates bodily into the views of others and so in the twinkling of an eye and with a heady rapture turns questions inside out and flings them empty before you on the ground like a triumphant conjurer it is my common practice when a piece of conduct puzzles me to attack it in the presence of jack with such grossness such partiality and such wearing iteration as at length shall spur him up in its defence in a moment he transmigrates dons the required character and with moonstruck philosophy justifies the act in question i can fancy nothing to compare with the vim of these impersonations the strange scale of language flying from shakespeare to kant and from kant to major dingwell 
as fast as a musician scatters sounds out of an instrument the sudden sweeping generalizations the absurd irrelevant particularities the wit wisdom folly humour eloquence and bathos each startling in its kind and yet all luminous in the admired disorder of their combination a talker of a different calibre though belonging to the same school is burley burley is a man of great presence he commands a larger atmosphere gives the impression of a grosser mass of character than most men it has been said of him that his presence could be felt in a room you entered blindfold and the same i think has been said of other powerful constitutions condemned to much physical inaction there is something boisterous and piratic in burley's manner of talk which suits well enough with this impression he will roar you down he will bury his face in his hands he will undergo passions of revolt and agony and meanwhile his attitude of mind is really both conciliatory and receptive and after pistol has been out pistoled and the welkin rung for hours you begin to perceive a certain subsidence in these spring torrents points of agreement issue and you end arm in arm and in a glow of mutual admiration the outcry only serves to make your final union the more unexpected and precious throughout there has been perfect sincerity perfect intelligence a desire to hear although not always to listen and an unaffected eagerness to meet concessions you have with burley none of the dangers that attend debate with spring-heeled jack who may at any moment turn his powers of transmigration on yourself create for you a view you never held and then furiously fall on you for holding it these at least are my two favourites and both are loud copious intolerant talkers this argues that i myself am in the same category for if we love talking at all we love a bright fierce adversary who will hold his ground foot by foot in much our own manner sell his attention dearly and give us our full measure of the dust and exertion of battle both these men can be beat from a position but it takes six hours to do it a high and hard adventure worth attempting with both you can pass days in an enchanted country of the mind with people scenery and manners of its own live a life apart more arduous active and glowing than any real existence and come forth again when the talk is over as out of a theatre or a dream to find the east wind still blowing and the chimney-pots of the old battered city still around you jack has the far finer mind burley the far more honest jack gives us the animated poetry burley the romantic prose of similar themes the one glances high like a meteor and makes a light in darkness the other with many changing hues of fire 
burns at the sea level like a conflagration but both have the same humour and artistic interests the same unquenched ardour in pursuit the same gusts of talk and thunderclaps of contradiction cockshot is a different article but vastly entertaining and has been meat and drink to me for many a long evening his manner is dry brisk and pertinacious and the choice of words not much the point about him is his extraordinary readiness and spirit you can propound nothing but he has either a theory about it ready-made or will have one instantly on the stocks and proceed to lay its timbers and launch it in your presence let me see he will say give me a moment i should have some theory for that a blither spectacle than the vigour with which he sets about the task it were hard to fancy he is possessed by a demoniac energy welding the elements for his life and bending ideas as an athlete bends a horseshoe with a visible and lively effort he has in theorizing a compass an art what i would call the synthetic gusto something of a herbert spencer who should see the fun of the thing you are not bound and no more is he to place your faith in these brand new opinions but some of them are right enough durable even for life and the poorest serve for a cock-shy as when idle people after picnics float a bottle on a pond and have an hour's diversion ere it sinks whichever they are serious opinions or humours of the moment he still defends his ventures with indefatigable wit and spirit hitting savagely himself but taking punishment like a man he knows and never forgets that people talk first of all for the sake of talking conducts himself in the ring to use the old slang like a thorough glutton and honestly enjoys a telling facer from his adversary cockshot is bottled effervescency the sworn foe of sleep three in the morning cockshot says a victim his talk is like the driest of all imaginable dry champagnes sleight of hand and inimitable quickness are the qualities by which he lives athelred on the other hand presents you with the spectacle of a sincere and somewhat slow nature thinking aloud he is the most unready man i ever knew to shine in conversation you may see him sometimes wrestle with a refractory jest for a minute or two together and perhaps fail to throw it in the end and there is something singularly engaging often instructive in the simplicity with which he thus exposes the process as well as the result the works as well as the dial of the clock withal he has his hours of inspiration apt words come to him as if by accident and coming from deeper down they smack the more personally they have the more of fine old crusted humanity rich in sediment and humour 
there are sayings of his in which he has stamped himself into the very grain of the language you would think he must have worn the words next his skin and slept with them yet it is not as a sayer of particular good things that athelred is most to be regarded rather as the stalwart woodman of thought i have pulled on a light cord often enough while he has been wielding the broad axe and between us on this unequal division many a specious fallacy has fallen i have known him to battle the same question night after night for years keeping it in the rein of talk constantly applying it and reapplying it to life with humorous or grave intention and all the while never hurrying nor flagging nor taking an unfair advantage of the facts jack at a given moment when arising as it were from the tripod can be more radiantly just to those from whom he differs but then the tenor of his thoughts is even calumnious while athelred slower to forge excuses is yet slower to condemn and sits over the welter of the world vacillating but still judicial and still faithfully contending with his doubts both the last talkers deal much in points of conduct and religion studied in the dry light of prose indirectly and as if against his will the same elements from time to time appear in the troubled and poetic talk of opelstein his varied and exotic knowledge complete although unready sympathies and fine full discriminative flow of language fit him out to be the best of talkers so perhaps he is with some not quite with me proxime accessit comes close i should say he sings the praises of the earth and the arts flowers and jewels wine and music in a moonlight serenading manner as to the light guitar even wisdom comes from his tongue like singing no one is indeed more tuneful in the upper notes but even while he sings the song of the sirens he still hearkens to the barking of the sphinx jarring byronic notes interrupt the flow of his horatian humours his mirth has something of the tragedy of the world for its perpetual background and he feasts like don giovanni to a double orchestra one lightly sounding for the dance one pealing beethoven in the distance he is not truly reconciled either with life or with himself and this instant war in his members sometimes divides the man's attention he does not always perhaps not often frankly surrender himself in conversation he brings into the talk other thoughts than those which he expresses you are conscious that he keeps an eye on something else that he does not shake off the world nor quite forget himself hence arise occasional disappointments even an occasional unfairness for his companions who find themselves one day giving too much and the next when they are weary out of season giving perhaps too little 
Purcell is in another class from any I have mentioned. He is no debater, but appears in conversation, as occasion arises, in two distinct characters, one of which I admire and fear, and the other love. In the first he is radiantly civil and rather silent, sits on a high, courtly hilltop, and from that vantage ground drops you his remarks like favours. He seems not to share in our sublunary contentions. He wears no sign of interest. When on a sudden there falls in a crystal of wit, so polished that the dull do not perceive it, but so right that the sensitive are silenced. True talk should have more body and blood, should be louder, vainer, and more declaratory of the man. The true talker should not hold so steady an advantage over whom he speaks with and that is one reason out of a score why I prefer my Purcell in his second character, when he unbends into a strain of graceful gossip, singing like the fireside kettle. In these moods he has an elegant homeliness that rings of the true Queen Anne. I know another person who attains in his moments to the insolence of a restoration comedy, speaking, I declare, as Congreve wrote. But that is a sport of nature, and scarce falls under the rubric, for there is none, alas, to give him answer. One last remark occurs. It is the mark of genuine conversation that the sayings can scarce be quoted with their full effect beyond the circle of common friends. To have their proper weight they should appear in a biography and with the portrait of the speaker. Good talk is dramatic. It is like an impromptu piece of acting, where each should represent himself to the greatest advantage. And that is the best kind of talk, where each speaker is most fully and candidly himself, and where, if you were to shift the speeches round from one to another, there would be the greatest loss in significance and perspicuity. It is for this reason that talk depends so wholly on our company. We should like to introduce Falstaff and Mercutio, or Falstaff and Sir Toby. But Falstaff in talk with Cordelia seems even painful. Most of us, by the protean quality of man, can talk to some degree with all. But the true talk, that strikes out all the slumbering best of us, comes only with the peculiar brethren of our spirits, is founded as deep as love in the constitution of our being, and is a thing to relish with all our energy while yet we have it, and to be grateful for forever. End of section four. Recording by Mark. Section 5 of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen 
Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson Section 5 Talk and Talkers Part 2 In the last paper there was perhaps too much about mere debate, and there was nothing said at all about that kind of talk which is merely luminous and restful, a higher power of silence, the quiet of the evening shared by ruminating friends. There is something, aside from personal preference, to be alleged in support of this omission. Those who are no chimney-cornerers, who rejoice in the social thunderstorm, have a ground in reason for their choice. They get little rest, indeed, but restfulness is a quality for cattle. The virtues are all active, life is alert, and it is in repose that men prepare themselves for evil. On the other hand, they are bruised into a knowledge of themselves and others. They have in a high degree the fencer's pleasure in dexterity displayed and proved. What they get, they get upon life's terms, paying for it as they go, and once the talk is launched, they are assured of honest dealing from an adversary eager like themselves. The aboriginal man within us, the cave-dweller, still lusty as when he fought tooth and nail for roots and berries, scents this kind of equal battle from afar. It is like his old primeval days upon the crags, a return to the sincerity of savage life from the comfortable fictions of the civilised. And if it be delightful to the old man, it is none the less profitable to his younger brother, the conscientious gentleman. I feel never quite sure of your urbane and smiling coteries. I fear they indulge a man's vanities in silence, suffer him to encroach, encourage him on to be an ass, and send him forth again, not merely contemned for the moment, but radically more contemptible than when he entered. But if I have a flushed, blustering fellow for my opposite, bent on carrying a point, my vanity is sure to have its ears rubbed once at least in the course of the debate. He will not spare me when we differ. He will not fear to demonstrate my folly to my face. For many natures there is not much charm in the still, chambered society, the circle of bland countenances, the digestive silence, the admired remark, the flutter of affectionate approval. They demand more atmosphere and exercise, a gale upon their spirits, as our pious ancestors would phrase it, to have their wits well breathed in an uproarious Valhalla. And I suspect that the choice, given their character and faults, is one to be defended. The purely wise are silenced by facts, they talk in a clear atmosphere, problems lying around them like a view in nature. If they can be shown to be somewhat in the wrong, they digest the reproof like a thrashing, and make better intellectual blood. 
they stand corrected by a whisper a word or a glance reminds them of the great eternal law but it is not so with all others in conversation seek rather contact with their fellow men than increase of knowledge or clarity of thought the drama not the philosophy of life is the sphere of their intellectual activity even where they pursue truth they desire as much as possible of what we may call human scenery along the road they follow they dwell in the heart of life the blood sounding in their ears their eyes laying hold of what delights them with a brutal avidity that makes them blind to all besides their interest riveted on people living loving talking tangible people to a man of this description the sphere of argument seems very pale and ghostly by a strong expression a perturbed countenance floods of tears an insult which his conscience obliges him to swallow he is brought round to knowledge which no syllogism would have conveyed to him his own experience is so vivid he is so superlatively conscious of himself that if day after day he is allowed to hector and hear nothing but approving echoes he will lose his hold on the soberness of things and take himself in earnest for a god talk might be to such an one the very way of moral ruin the school where he might learn to be at once intolerable and ridiculous this character is perhaps commoner than philosophers suppose and for persons of that stamp to learn much by conversation they must speak with their superiors not in intellect for that is a superiority that must be proved but in station if they cannot find a friend to bully them for their good they must find either an old man a woman or someone so far below them in the artificial order of society that courtesy may be particularly exercised the best teachers are the aged to the old our mouths are always partly closed we must swallow our obvious retorts and listen they sit above our heads on life's raised dais and appeal at once to our respect and pity a flavour of the old school a touch of something different in their manner which is freer and rounder if they come of what is called a good family and often more timid and precise if they are of the middle class serves in these days to accentuate the difference of age and add a distinction to grey hairs but their superiority is founded more deeply than by outward marks or gestures they are before us in the march of man they have more or less solved the irking problem they have battled through the equinox of life in good and evil they have held their course and now without open shame they near the crown and harbour it may be we have been struck with one of fortune's darts we can scarce be civil so cruelly is our spirit tossed yet long before we were so much as thought upon 
the like calamity befell the old man or woman that now with pleasant humour rallies us upon our inattention sitting composed in the holy evening of man's life in the clear shining after rain we grow ashamed of our distresses new and hot and coarse like villainous roadside brandy we see life in aerial perspective under the heavens of faith and out of the worst in the mere presence of contented elders look forward and take patience fear shrinks before them like a thing reproved not the flitting and ineffectual fear of death but the instant dwelling terror of the responsibilities and revenges of life their speech indeed is timid they report lions in the path they counsel a meticulous footing but their serene marred faces are more eloquent and tell another story where they have gone we will go also not very greatly fearing what they have endured unbroken we also god helping us will make a shift to bear not only is the presence of the aged in itself remedial but their minds are stored with antidotes wisdom's simples plain considerations overlooked by use they have matter to communicate be they never so stupid their talk is not merely literature it is great literature classic in virtue of the speaker's detachment studied like a book of travel with things we should not otherwise have learnt in virtue i have said of the speaker's detachment and this is why of two old men the one who is not your father speaks to you with the more sensible authority for in the paternal relation the oldest have lively interests and remain still young thus i have known two young men great friends each swore by the other's father the father of each swore by the other lad and yet each pair of parent and child were perpetually by the ears this is typical it reads like the germ of some kindly comedy the old appear in conversation in two characters the critically silent and the garrulous anecdotic the last is perhaps what we look for it is perhaps the more instructive an old gentleman well on in years sits handsomely and naturally in the bow window of his age scanning experience with reverted eye and chirping and smiling communicates the accidents and reads the lesson of his long career opinions are strengthened indeed but they are also weeded out in the course of years what remains steadily present to the eye of the retired veteran in his hermitage what still ministers to his content what still quickens his old honest heart these are the real long-lived things that whitman tells us to prefer where youth agrees with age not where they differ wisdom lies and it is when the young disciple finds his heart to beat in tune with his grey-bearded teachers that a lesson may be learned 
i have known one old gentleman whom i may name for he is now gathered to his stock robert hunter sheriff of dunbarton and author of an excellent law-book still re-edited and republished whether he was originally big or little is more than i can guess when i knew him he was all fallen away and fallen in crooked and shrunken buckled into a stiff waistcoat for support troubled by ailments which kept him hobbling in and out of the room one foot gouty a wig for decency not for deception on his head close shaved except under his chin and for that he never failed to apologize for it went sore against the traditions of his life you can imagine how he would fare in a novel by miss mather yet this rag of a chelsea veteran lived to his last year in the plenitude of all that is best in man brimming with human kindness and staunch as a roman soldier under his manifold infirmities you could not say that he had lost his memory for he would repeat shakespeare and webster and jeremy taylor and burke by the page together but the parchment was filled up there was no room for fresh inscriptions and he was capable of repeating the same anecdote on many successive visits his voice survived in its full power and he took a pride in using it on his last voyage as commissioner of lighthouses he hailed a ship at sea and made himself clearly audible without a speaking trumpet roughing the while with a proper vanity in his achievement he had a habit of eking out his words with interrogative hems which was puzzling and a little wearisome suited ill with his appearance and seemed a survival from some former stage of bodily portliness of yore when he was a great pedestrian and no enemy to good claret he may have pointed with these minute guns his allocutions to the bench his humour was perfectly equable set beyond the reach of fate gout rheumatism stone and gravel might have combined their forces against that frail tabernacle but when i came round on sunday evening he would lay aside jeremy taylor's life of christ and greet me with the same open brow the same kind formality of manner his opinions and sympathies dated the man almost to a decade he had begun life under his mother's influence as an admirer of junius but on maturer knowledge had transferred his admiration to burke he cautioned me with entire gravity to be punctilious in writing english never to forget that i was a scotchman that english was a foreign tongue and that if i attempted the colloquial i should certainly be shamed the remark was apposite i suppose in the days of david hume scott was too new for him he had known the author known him too for a tory and to the genuine classic a contemporary is always something of a trouble he had the old serious love of the play had even as he was proud to tell played a certain part in the history of shakespearean revivals for he had successfully pressed on murray of the old edinburgh theatre 
the idea of producing Shakespeare's fairy pieces with great scenic display. A moderate in religion, he was much struck in the last years of his life by a conversation with two young lads, revivalists. Hmm, he would say, new to me, I have had, hmm, no such experience. It struck him not with pain, rather with a solemn philosophic interest, that he, a Christian as he hoped, and a Christian of so old a standing, should hear these young fellows talking of his own subject, his own weapons that he had fought the battle of life with, and, hmm, not understand. In this wise and grateful attitude he did justice to himself and others, reposed unshaken in his old beliefs, and recognised their limits without anger or alarm. His last recorded remark, on the last night of his life, was after he had been arguing against Calvinism with his minister and was interrupted by an intolerable pang. "'After all,' he said, "'of all the isms, I know none so bad as rheumatism.' My own last sight of him was some time before, when we dined together at an inn. He had been on circuit, for he stuck to his duties like a chief part of his existence and I remember it as the only occasion on which he ever soiled his lips with slang, a thing he loathed. We were both Roberts, and as we took our places at table, he addressed me with a twinkle. We're just what you would call two bob. He offered me port, I remember, as the proper milk of youth, spoke of twenty shilling notes, and throughout the meal was full of old-world pleasantry and quaintness, like an ancient boy on a holiday. But what I recall chiefly was his confession that he had never read Othello to an end. Shakespeare was his continual study. He loved nothing better than to display his knowledge and memory by adducing parallel passages from Shakespeare, passages where the same word was employed, or the same idea differently treated. But Othello had beaten him. That noble gentleman and that noble lady, hmm, too painful for me. The same night the boardings were covered with posters, burlesque of Othello, and the contrast blazed up in my mind like a bonfire. An unforgettable look it gave me into that kind man's soul. His acquaintance was indeed a liberal and pious education. All the humanities were taught in that bare dining-room beside his gouty footstool. He was a piece of good advice. He was himself the instance that pointed and adorned his various talk. Nor could a young man have found elsewhere a place so set apart from envy, fear, discontent or any of the passions that debase, a life so honest and composed, a soul like an ancient violin, so subdued to harmony, responding to a touch in music, as in that dining-room, with Mr. Hunter chatting at the eleventh hour, under the shadow of eternity, fearless and gentle. The second class of old people are not anecdotic. 
they are rather hearers than talkers listening to the young with an amused and critical attention to have this sort of intercourse to perfection i think we must go to old ladies women are better hearers than men to begin with they learn i fear in anguish to bear with the tedious and infantile vanity of the other sex and we will take more from a woman than even from the oldest man in the way of biting comment biting comment is the chief part whether for profit or amusement in this business the old lady that i have in my eye is a very caustic speaker her tongue after years of practice in absolute command whether for silence or attack if she chance to dislike you you will be tempted to curse the malignity of age but if you chance to please even slightly you will be listened to with a particular laughing grace of sympathy and from time to time chastised as if in play with a parasol as heavy as a pole-axe it requires a singular art as well as the vantage-ground of age to deal these stunning corrections among the coxcombs of the young the pill is disguised in sugar of wit it is administered as a compliment if you had not pleased you would not have been censured it is a personal affair a hyphen a trait d'union between you and your censor age is philandering for her pleasure and your good incontestably the young man feels very much of a fool but he must be a perfect malvolio sick with self-love if he cannot take an open buffet and still smile the correction of silence is what kills when you know you have transgressed and your friend says nothing and avoids your eye if a man were made of gutter percha his heart would quail at such a moment but when the word is out the worst is over and a fellow with any good humour at all may pass through a perfect hail of witty criticism every bare place on his soul hit to the quick with a shrewd missile and reappear as if after a dive tingling with a fine moral reaction and ready with a shrinking readiness one third loath for a repetition of the discipline there are few women not well sunned and ripened and perhaps toughened who can thus stand apart from a man and say the true thing with a kind of genial cruelty still there are some and i doubt if there be any man who can return the compliment the class of men represented by vernon whitford in the egoist says indeed the true thing but he says it stockishly vernon is a noble fellow and makes by the way a noble and instructive contrast to daniel deronda his conduct is the conduct of a man of honour but we agree with him against our consciences when he remorsefully considers its astonishing dryness he is the best of men but the best of women manage to combine all that and something more their very faults assist them they are helped even by the falseness of their position in life they can retire into the fortified camp of the proprieties 
they can touch a subject and suppress it the most adroit employ a somewhat elaborate reserve as a means to be frank much as they wear gloves when they shake hands but a man has the full responsibility of his freedom cannot evade a question can scarce be silent without rudeness must answer for his words upon the moment and is not seldom left face to face with a damning choice between the more or less dishonourable wriggling of deronda and the downright woodenness of vernon whitford but the superiority of women is perpetually menaced they do not sit throned on infirmities like the old they are suitors as well as sovereigns their vanity is engaged their affections are too apt to follow and hence much of the talk between the sexes degenerates into something unworthy of the name the desire to please to shine with a certain softness of lustre and to draw a fascinating picture of oneself banishes from conversation all that is sterling and most of what is humorous as soon as a strong current of mutual admiration begins to flow the human interest triumphs entirely over the intellectual and the commerce of words consciously or not becomes secondary to the commercing of eyes but even where this ridiculous danger is avoided and a man and woman converse equally and honestly something in their nature or their education falsifies the strain an instinct prompts them to agree and where that is impossible to agree to differ should they neglect the warning at the first suspicion of an argument they find themselves in different hemispheres about any point of business or conduct any actual affair demanding settlement a woman will speak and listen hear and answer arguments not only with natural wisdom but with candour and logical honesty but if the subject of debate be something in the air an abstraction an excuse for talk a logical aunt sally then may the male debater instantly abandon hope he may employ reason adduce facts be supple be smiling be angry all shall avail him nothing what the woman said first that unless she has forgotten it she will repeat at the end hence at the very junctures when a talk between men grows brighter and quicker and begins to promise to bear fruit talk between the sexes is menaced with dissolution the point of difference the point of interest is evaded by the brilliant woman under a shower of irrelevant conversational rockets it is bridged by the discreet woman with a rustle of silk as she passes smoothly forward to the nearest point of safety and this sort of prestidigitation juggling the dangerous topic out of sight until it can be reintroduced with safety in an altered shape is a piece of tactics among the true drawing-room queens the drawing-room is indeed an artificial place it is so by our choice and for our sins the subjection of women 
the ideal imposed upon them from the cradle and worn like a hair shirt with so much constancy their motherly superior tenderness to man's vanity and self-importance their managing arts the arts of a civilized slave among good-natured barbarians are all painful ingredients and all help to falsify relations it is not till we get clear of that amusing artificial scene that genuine relations are founded or ideas honestly compared in the garden on the road or the hillside or tete-a-tete -tete, and apart from interruptions occasions arise when we may learn much from any single woman and nowhere more often than in married life marriage is one long conversation chequered by disputes the disputes are valueless they but ingrain the difference the heroic heart of woman prompting her at once to nail her colours to the mast but in the intervals almost unconsciously and with no desire to shine the whole material of life is turned over and over ideas are struck out and shared the two persons more and more adapt their notions one to suit the other and in process of time without sound of trumpet they conduct each other into new worlds of thought. End of section five. Recording by Section six of essays of robert louis stevenson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson essays of robert louis stevenson section 6 a gossip on romance in anything fit to be called by the name of reading the process itself should be absorbing and voluptuous we should gloat over a book be wrapped clean out of ourselves and rise from the perusal our mind filled with the busiest kaleidoscopic dance of images incapable of sleep or of continuous thought the words if the book be eloquent should run thenceforward in our ears like the noise of breakers and the story if it be a story repeat itself in a thousand coloured pictures to the eye it was for this last pleasure that we read so closely and loved our books so dearly in the bright troubled period of boyhood eloquence and thought character and conversation were but obstacles to brush aside as we dug blithely after a certain sort of incident like a pig for truffles for my part i liked a story to begin with an old wayside inn where towards the close of the year seventeen several gentlemen in three cocked hats were playing bowls a friend of mine preferred the malabar coast in a storm with a ship beating to windward and a scowling fellow of herculean proportions striding along the beach he to be sure was a pirate 
this was further afield than my home-keeping fancy loved to travel and designed altogether for a larger canvas than the tales that i affected give me a highwayman and i was full to the brim a jacobite would do but the highwayman was my favourite dish i can still hear that merry clatter of the hoofs along the moonlit lane night and the coming of day are still related in my mind with the doings of john ran or jerry abershaw and the words post chaise the great north road ostler and nag still sound in my ears like poetry one and all at least and each with his particular fancy we read story-books in childhood not for eloquence or character or thought but for some quality of the brute incident that quality was not mere bloodshed or wonder although each of these was welcome in its place the charm for the sake of which we read depended on something different from either my elders used to read novels aloud and i can still remember four different passages which i heard before i was ten with the same keen and lasting pleasure one i discovered long afterwards to be the admirable opening of what will he do with it it was no wonder i was pleased with that the other three still remain unidentified one is a little vague it was about a dark tall house at night and people groping on the stairs by the light that escaped from the open door of a sick-room in another a lover left a ball and went walking in a cool dewy park whence he could watch the lighted windows and the figures of the dancers as they moved this was the most sentimental impression i think i had yet received for a child is somewhat deaf to the sentimental in the last a poet who had been tragically wrangling with his wife walked forth on the sea beach on a tempestuous night and witnessed the horrors of a wreck different as they are all these early favourites have a common note they have all a touch of the romantic drama is the poetry of conduct romance the poetry of circumstance the pleasure that we take in life is of two sorts the active and the passive now we are conscious of a great command over our destiny anon we are lifted up by circumstance as by a breaking wave and dashed we know not how into the future now we are pleased by our conduct anon merely pleased by our surroundings it would be hard to say which of these modes of satisfaction is the more effective but the latter is surely the more constant conduct is three parts of life they say but i think they put it high there is a vast deal in life and letters both which is not immoral but simply amoral which either does not regard the human will at all or deals with it in obvious and healthy relations where the interest turns not upon what a man shall choose to do but on how he manages to do it 
not on the passionate slips and hesitations of the conscience, but on the problems of the body, and of the practical intelligence, in clean, open-air adventure, the shock of arms, or the diplomacy of life. With such material as this, it is impossible to build a play, for the serious theatre exists solely on moral grounds, and is a standing proof of the dissemination of the human conscience. But it is possible to build, upon this ground, the most joyous of verses, and the most lively, beautiful, and buoyant tales. One thing in life calls for another. There is a fitness in events and places. The sight of a pleasant arbour puts it in our minds to sit there. One place suggests work, another idleness, a third early rising and long rambles in the dew. The effect of night of any flowing water, of lighted cities, of the peep of day, of ships, of the open ocean, calls up in the mind an army of anonymous desires and pleasures. Something we feel should happen. We know not what, yet we proceed in quest of it and many of the happiest hours of life fleet by us in this vain attendance on the genius of the place and moment. It is thus that tracts of young fir and low rocks that reach into deep soundings particularly torture and delight me. Something must have happened in such places and perhaps ages back, to members of my race. When I was a child, I tried in vain to invent appropriate games for them, as I still try, just as vainly, to fit them with the proper story. Some places speak distinctly. Certain dank gardens cry aloud for a murder. Certain old houses demand to be haunted. Certain coasts are set apart for shipwreck. Other spots, again, seem to abide their destiny, suggestive and impenetrable, mitching malicho. The inn at Burford Bridge with its arbours and green garden, and silent eddying river, though it is known already as the place where Keats wrote some of his Endymion, and Nelson parted from his Emma, still seems to wait the coming of the appropriate legend. Within these ivied walls, behind these old green shutters, some further business smoulders, waiting for its hour. The old Hawes Inn at the Queen's Ferry makes a similar call upon my fancy. There it stands, apart from the town, beside the pier, in a climate of its own, half inland, half marine. In front, the ferry bubbling with the tide, and the guardship swinging to her anchor. Behind, the old garden with the trees. Americans seek it already for the sake of Lovell and Old Buck, who dined there at the beginning of the antiquary. But you need not tell me, that is not all. There is some story unrecorded, or not yet complete, which must express the meaning of that inn more fully. So it is with names and faces. 
so it is with incidents that are idle and inconclusive in themselves and yet seem like the beginning of some quaint romance which the all-careless author leaves untold how many of these romances have we not seen determine at their birth how many people have met us with a look of meaning in their eye and sunk at once into trivial acquaintances to how many places have we not drawn near with express intimations here my destiny awaits me and we have but dined there and passed on i have lived both at the hawes and burford in a perpetual flutter on the heels as it seemed of some adventure that should justify the place but though the feeling had me to bed at night and called me again at morning in one unbroken round of pleasure and suspense nothing befell me in either worth remark the man or the hour had not yet come but some day i think a boat shall put off from the queen's ferry fraught with a dear cargo and some frosty night a horseman on a tragic errand rattle with his whip upon the green shutters of the inn at burford now this is one of the natural appetites with which any lively literature has to count the desire for knowledge i had almost added the desire for meat is not more deeply seated than this demand for fit and striking incident the dullest of clowns tells or tries to tell himself a story as the feeblest of children uses invention in his play and even as the imaginative grown person joining in the game at once enriches it with many delightful circumstances the great creative writer shows us the realization and the apotheosis of the daydreams of common men his stories may be nourished with the realities of life but their true mark is to satisfy the nameless longings of the reader and to obey the ideal laws of the daydream the right kind of thing should fall out in the right kind of place the right kind of thing should follow and not only the characters talk aptly and think naturally but all the circumstances in a tale answer to one another like notes in music the threads of a story come from time to time together and make a picture in the web the characters fall from time to time into some attitude to each other or to nature which stamps the story home like an illustration crusoe recoiling from the footprint achilles shouting over against the trojans ulysses bending the great bow christian running with his fingers in his ears these are each culminating moments in the legend and each has been printed on the mind's eye forever other things we may forget we may forget the words although they are beautiful we may forget the author's comment although perhaps it was ingenious and true but these epoch-making scenes which put the last mark of truth upon a story and fill up at one blow our capacity for sympathetic pleasure 
we so adopt into the very bosom of our mind that neither time nor tide can efface or weaken the impression this then is the plastic part of literature to embody character thought or emotion in some act or attitude that shall be remarkably striking to the mind's eye this is the highest and hardest thing to do in words the thing which once accomplished equally delights the schoolboy and the sage and makes in its own right the quality of epics compared with this all other purposes in literature except the purely lyrical or the purely philosophic are bastard in nature facile of execution and feeble in result it is one thing to write about the inn at burford or to describe the scenery with the word painters it is quite another to seize on the heart of the suggestion and make a country famous with a legend it is one thing to remark and to dissect with the most cutting logic the complications of life and of the human spirit it is quite another to give them body and blood in the story of ajax or of hamlet the first is literature but the second is something besides for it is likewise art english people of the present day are apt i know not why to look somewhat down on incident and reserve their admiration for the clink of teaspoons and the accents of the curate it is thought clever to write a novel with no story at all or at least with a very dull one reduced even to the lowest terms a certain interest can be communicated by the art of narrative a sense of human kinship stirred and a kind of monotonous fitness comparable to the words and air of sandy's mull preserved among the infinitesimal occurrences recorded some people work in this manner with even a strong touch mr trollope's inimitable clergyman naturally arise to the mind in this connection but even mr trollope does not confine himself to chronicling small beer mr crawley's collision with the bishop's wife mr melnet dallying in the deserted banquet-room are typical incidents epically conceived fitly embodying a crisis or again look at thackeray if rawdon crawley's blow were not delivered vanity fair would cease to be a work of art that scene is the chief ganglion of the tale and the discharge of energy from rawdon's fist is the reward and consolation of the reader the end of esmond is a yet wider excursion from the author's customary fields the scene at castle wood is pure dumas the great and wily english borrower has here borrowed from the great unblushing french thief as usual he has borrowed admirably well and the breaking of the sword rounds off the best of all his books with a manly martial note but perhaps nothing can more strongly illustrate the necessity for marking incident than to compare the living fame of robinson crusoe with the discredit of clarissa harlowe 
clarissa is a book of a far more startling import worked out on a great canvas with inimitable courage and unflagging art it contains wit character passion plot conversations full of spirit and insight letters sparkling with unstrained humanity and if the death of the heroine be somewhat frigid and artificial the last days of the hero strike the only note of what we now call byronism between the elizabethans and byron himself and yet a little story of a shipwrecked sailor with not a tenth part of the style nor a thousandth part of the wisdom exploring none of the arcana of humanity and deprived of the perennial interest of love goes on from edition to edition ever young while clarissa lies upon the shelves unread a friend of mine a welsh blacksmith was twenty-five years old and could neither read nor write when he heard a chapter of robinson read aloud in a farm kitchen up to that moment he had sat content huddled in his ignorance but he left that farm another man there were daydreams it appeared divine daydreams written and printed and bound and to be bought for money and enjoyed at pleasure down he sat that day painfully learned to read welsh and returned to borrow the book it had been lost nor could he find another copy but one that was in english down he sat once more learned english and at length and with entire delight read robinson it is like the story of a love chase if he had heard a letter from clarissa would he have been fired with the same chivalrous ardour i wonder yet clarissa has every quality that could be shown in prose one alone excepted pictorial or picture-making romance while robinson depends for the most part and with the overwhelming majority of its readers on the charm of circumstance in the highest achievements of the art of words the dramatic and the pictorial the moral and romantic interest rise and fall together by a common and organic law situation is animated with passion passion clothed upon with situation neither exists for itself but each inheres indissolubly with the other this is high art and not only the highest art possible in words but the highest art of all since it combines the greatest mass and diversity of the elements of truth and pleasure such are epics and the few prose tales that have the epic weight but as from a school of works aping the creative incident and romance are ruthlessly discarded so may character and drama be omitted or subordinated to romance there is one book for example more generally loved than shakespeare that captivates in childhood and still delights in age i mean the arabian nights where you shall look in vain for moral or for intellectual interest 
no human face or voice greets us among that wooden crowd of kings and genies sorcerers and beggar-men adventure on the most naked terms furnishes forth the entertainment and is found enough dumas approaches perhaps nearest of any modern to these arabian authors in the purely material charm of some of his romances the early part of monte cristo down to the finding of the treasure is a piece of perfect story-telling the man never breathed who shared these moving incidents without a tremor and yet paria is a thing of pack-thread and dantes little more than a name the sequel is one long-drawn error gloomy bloody unnatural and dull but as for these early chapters i do not believe there is another volume extant where you can breathe the same unmingled atmosphere of romance it is very thin and light to be sure as on a high mountain but it is brisk and clear and sunny in proportion i saw the other day with envy an old and a very clever lady setting forth on a second or third voyage into monte cristo here are stories which powerfully affect the reader which can be re-perused at any age and where the characters are no more than puppets the bony fist of the showman visibly propels them their springs are an open secret their faces are of wood their bellies filled with bran and yet we thrillingly partake of their adventures and the point may be illustrated still further the last interview between lucy and richard feverell is pure drama more than that it is the strongest scene since shakespeare in the english tongue their first meeting by the river on the other hand is pure romance it has nothing to do with character it might happen to any other boy and maiden and be none the less delightful for the change and yet i think he would be a bold man who should choose between these passages thus in the same book we may have two scenes each capital in its order in the one human passion deep calling unto deep shall utter its genuine voice in the second according circumstances like instruments in tune shall build up a trivial but desirable incident such as we love to prefigure for ourselves and in the end in spite of the critics we may hesitate to give the preference to either the one may ask more genius i do not say it does but at least the other dwells as clearly in the memory true romantic art again makes a romance of all things it reaches into the highest abstraction of the ideal it does not refuse the most pedestrian realism robinson crusoe is as realistic as it is romantic both qualities are pushed to an extreme and neither suffers nor does romance depend upon the material importance of the incidents to deal with strong and deadly elements banditti pirates war and murder is to conjure with great names and in the event of failure to double the disgrace 
the arrival of Haydn and Consuelo at the canon's villa is a very trifling incident. Yet we may read a dozen boisterous stories from beginning to end, and not receive so fresh and stirring an impression of adventure. It was the scene of Crusoe at the wreck, if I remember rightly, that so bewitched my blacksmith. Nor is the fact surprising. Every single article the castaway recovers from the hulk is a joy for ever to the man who reads of them. They are the things that should be found, and the bare enumeration stirs the blood. I found a glimmer of the same interest the other day in a new book, The Sailor's Sweetheart, by Mr. Clark Russell. The whole business of the brig Morning Star is very rightly felt and spiritedly written, but the clothes, the books, and the money satisfy the reader's mind like things to eat. We are dealing here with the old cut-and-dry legitimate interest of treasure trove. But even treasure trove can be made dull. There are few people who have not groaned under the plethora of goods that fell to the lot of the Swiss family Robinson, that dreary family. They found article after article, creature after creature, from milk kind to pieces of ordnance, a whole consignment, but no informing taste had presided over the selection. There was no smack or relish in the invoice, and these riches left the fancy cold. The box of goods in Verne's mysterious island is another case in point. There was no gusto and no glamour about that. It might have come from a shop. But the two hundred and seventy-eight Australian sovereigns on board the Morning Star fell upon me like a surprise that I had expected. Whole vistas of secondary stories, besides the one in hand, radiated forth from that discovery, as they radiate from a striking particular in life, and I was made for the moment as happy as a reader has the right to be. To come at all at the nature of this quality of romance, we must bear in mind the peculiarity of our attitude to any art. No art produces illusion. In the theatre we never forget that we are in the theatre. And while we read a story, we sit wavering between two minds, now merely clapping our hands at the merit of the performance now condescending to take an active part in fancy with the characters. This last is the triumph of romantic story-telling, when the reader consciously plays at being the hero, the scene is a good scene. Now in character studies the pleasure that we take is critical. We watch, we approve, we smile at incongruities, we are moved to sudden heats of sympathy with courage, suffering, or virtue. But the characters are still themselves, they are not us. The more clearly they are depicted, the more widely do they stand away from us, the more imperiously do they thrust us back into our place as a spectator. I cannot identify myself with Rawdon Crawley, or with Eugène de Rastignac, 
for i have scarce a hope or fear in common with them it is not character but incident that woos us out of our reserve something happens as we desire to have it happen to ourselves some situation that we have long dallied with in fancy is realized in the story with enticing and appropriate details then we forget the characters then we push the hero aside then we plunge into the tale in our own person and bathe in fresh experience and then and then only do we say we have been reading a romance it is not only pleasurable things that we imagine in our daydreams there are lights in which we are willing to contemplate even the idea of our own death ways in which it seems as if it would amuse us to be cheated wounded or calumniated it is thus possible to construct a story even of tragic import in which every incident detail and trick of circumstance shall be welcome to the reader's thoughts fiction is to the grown man what play is to the child it is there that he changes the atmosphere and tenor of his life and when the game so chimes with his fancy that he can join in it with all his heart when it pleases him with every turn when he loves to recall it and dwells upon its recollection with entire delight fiction is called romance walter scott is out and away the king of the romantics the lady of the lake has no indisputable claim to be a poem beyond the inherent fitness and desirability of the tale it is just such a story as a man would make up for himself walking in the best health and temper through just such scenes as it is laid in hence it is that a charm dwells undefinable among these slovenly verses as the unseen cuckoo fills the mountains with his note hence even after we have flung the book aside the scenery and adventures remain present to the mind a new and green possession not unworthy of that beautiful name the lady of the lake or that direct romantic opening one of the most spirited and poetical in literature the stag at eve had drunk his fill the same strength and the same weaknesses adorn and disfigure the novels in that ill-written ragged book the pirate the figure of cleveland cast up by the sea on the resounding foreland of dunrossness moving with the blood on his hands and the spanish words on his tongue among the simple islanders singing a serenade under the window of his shetland mistress is conceived in the very highest manner of romantic invention the words of his song through groves of palm sung in such a scene and by such a lover clench as in a nutshell the emphatic contrast upon which the tale is built in guy mannering again every incident is delightful to the imagination and the scene when harry bertram lands at ellen gowan is a model instance of romantic method i remember the tune well he says 
though i cannot guess what should at present so strongly recall it to my memory he took his flageolet from his pocket and played a simple melody apparently the tune awoke the corresponding associations of a damsel she immediately took up the song are these the links of forth she said or are they the crooks of dee or the bonny woods of warach head that i so fain would see by heaven said bertram it is the very ballad on this quotation two remarks fall to be made first as an instance of modern feeling for romance this famous touch of the flageolet and the old song is selected by miss braddon for omission miss braddon's idea of a story like mistress todgers's idea of a wooden leg where something strange to have expounded as a matter of personal experience meg's appearance to old mr bertram on the road the ruins of dernclüch the scene of the flageolet and the dominie's recognition of harry are the four strong notes that continue to ring in the mind after the book is laid aside the second point is still more curious the reader will observe a mark of excision in the passage as quoted by me well here is how it runs in the original a damsel who close behind a fine spring about half way down the descent and which had once supplied the castle with water was engaged in bleaching linen a man who gave in such copy would be discharged from the staff of a daily paper scott has forgotten to prepare the reader for the presence of the damsel he has forgotten to mention the spring and its relation to the ruin and now face to face with his omission instead of trying back and starting fair crams all this matter tail foremost into a single shambling sentence it is not merely bad english or bad style it is abominably bad narrative besides certainly the contrast is remarkable and it is one that throws a strong light upon the subject of this paper for here we have a man of the finest creative instinct touching with perfect certainty and charm the romantic junctures of his story and we find him utterly careless almost it would seem incapable in the technical matter of style and not only frequently weak but frequently wrong in points of drama in character parts indeed and particularly in the scotch he was delicate strong and truthful but the trite obliterated features of too many of his heroes have already wearied two generations of readers at times his characters will speak with something far beyond propriety with a true heroic note but on the next page they will be wading wearily forward with an ungrammatical and undramatic rigmarole of words the man who could conceive and write the character of elspeth of the craigburn foot as scott has conceived and written it had not only splendid romantic but splendid tragic gifts how comes it then that he could so often fob us off with languid inarticulate twaddle it seems to me 
that the explanation is to be found in the very quality of his surprising merits. As his books are play to the reader, so were they play to him. He conjured up the romantic with delight, but he had hardly patience to describe it. He was a great daydreamer, a seer of fit and beautiful and humorous visions, but hardly a great artist, hardly in the manful sense an artist at all. He pleased himself, and so he pleases us. Of the pleasures of his art he tasted fully, but of its toils and vigils and distresses never man knew less. A great romantic, an idle child. End of section six. Recording. Section 7 of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson Section 7 The Character of Dogs The Civilization, the Manners, and the morals of dog kind are to a great extent subordinated to those of his ancestral master man this animal in many ways so superior has accepted a position of inferiority shares the domestic life and humours the caprices of the tyrant but the potentate, like the British in India, pays small regard to the character of his willing client, judges him with listless glances, and condemns him in a byword. Listless have been the looks of his admirers, who have exhausted idle terms of praise and buried the poor soul below exaggerations and yet more idle and if possible more unintelligent has been the attitude of his express detractors those who are very fond of dogs but in their proper place who say poor fellow poor fellow and are themselves far poorer who wet the knife of the vivisectionist or heat his oven who are not ashamed to admire the creature's instinct and flying far beyond folly have dared to resuscitate the theory of animal machines the dog's instinct and the automaton dog in this age of psychology and science sound like strange anachronisms an automaton he certainly is a machine working independently of his control the heart like the mill-wheel keeping all in motion and the consciousness like a person shut in the mill garret enjoying the view out of the window and shaken by the thunder of the stones an automaton in one corner of which a living spirit is confined an automaton like man instinct again he certainly possesses inherited aptitudes are his inherited frailties some things he at once views and understands as though he were awakened from a sleep 
as though he came trailing clouds of glory. But with him, as with man, the field of instinct is limited. Its utterances are obscure and occasional. And about the far larger part of life, both the dog and his master must conduct their steps by deduction and observation. The leading distinction between dog and man, after, and perhaps before, the different duration of their lives, is that the one can speak, and that the other cannot. The absence of the power of speech confines the dog in the development of his intellect. It hinders him from many speculations, for words are the beginning of metaphysic. At the same blow it saves him from many superstitions, and his silence has won for him a higher name for virtue than his conduct justifies. The faults of the dog are many. He is vainer than man, singularly greedy of notice, singularly intolerant of ridicule, suspicious like the deaf, jealous to the degree of frenzy, and radically devoid of truth. The day of an intelligent small dog is passed in the manufacture and the laborious communication of falsehood. He lies with his tail, he lies with his eye, he lies with his protesting paw, and when he rattles his dish or scratches at the door, his purpose is other than appears. But he has some apology to offer for the vice. Many of the signs which form his dialect have come to bear an arbitrary meaning, clearly understood both by his master and himself. Yet, when a new want arises, he must either invent a new vehicle of meaning, or rest an old one to a different purpose. And this necessity, frequently recurring, must tend to lessen his idea of the sanctity of symbols. Meanwhile, the dog is clear in his own conscience, and draws with a human nicety the distinction between formal and essential truth. Of his punning perversions, his legitimate dexterity with symbols, he is even vain. But when he has told and been detected in a lie, there is not a hair upon his body but confesses guilt. To a dog of gentlemanly feeling, theft and falsehood are disgraceful vices. The canine, like the human gentleman, demands in his misdemeanours, Montaigne's, je ne sais quoi de généreux, bit of generosity. He is never more than half ashamed of having barked or bitten and for those faults into which he has been led by the desire to shine before a lady of his race, he retains, even under physical correction, a share of pride. But to be caught lying, if he understands it, instantly uncurls his fleece. Just as among dull observers he preserves a name for truth, the dog has been credited with modesty. It is amazing how the use of language blunts the faculties of man, that because vainglory finds no vent in words, creatures supplied with eyes have been unable to detect a fault so gross and obvious. 
if a small spoiled dog were suddenly to be endowed with speech he would prate interminably and still about himself when we had friends we should be forced to lock him in a garret and what with his whining jealousies and his foible for falsehood in a year's time he would have gone far to weary out our love i was about to compare him to sir willoughby patterne but the patternes have a manlier sense of their own merits and the parallel besides is ready hans christian anderson as we behold him in his startling memoirs thrilling from top to toe with an excruciating vanity and scouting even along the street for shadows of offence here was the talking dog it is just this rage for consideration that has betrayed the dog into his satellite position as the friend of man the cat an animal of franker appetites preserves his independence but the dog with one eye ever on the audience has been wheedled into slavery and praised and patted into the renunciation of his nature once he ceased hunting and became man's plate liquor the rubicon was crossed thenceforth he was a gentleman of leisure and except the few whom we keep working the whole race grew more and more self-conscious mannered and affected the number of things that a small dog does naturally is strangely small enjoying better spirits and not crushed under material cares he is far more theatrical than average man his whole life if he be a dog of any pretension to gallantry is spent in a vain show and in the hot pursuit of admiration take out your puppy for a walk and you will find the little ball of fur clumsy stupid bewildered but natural let but a few months pass and when you repeat the process you will find nature buried in convention he will do nothing plainly but the simplest processes of our material life will all be bent into the forms of an elaborate and mysterious etiquette instinct says the fool has awakened but it is not so some dogs some at the very least if they be kept separate from others remain quite natural and these when at length they meet with a companion of experience and have the game explained to them distinguish themselves by the severity of their devotion to its rules i wish i were allowed to tell a story which would radiantly illuminate the point but men like dogs have an elaborate and mysterious etiquette it is their bond of sympathy that both are the children of convention the person man or dog who has a conscience is eternally condemned to some degree of humbug the sense of the law in their members fatally precipitates either towards a frozen and affected bearing and the converse is true and in the elaborate and conscious manners of the dog moral opinions and the love of the ideal stand confessed to follow for ten minutes in the street 
some swaggering canine cavalier, is to receive a lesson in dramatic art, and the cultured conduct of the body. In every act and gesture you see him true to a refined conception, and the dullest cur beholding him pricks up his ear and proceeds to imitate and parody that charming ease. For to be a high-mannered and high-minded gentleman, careless, affable, and gay, is the inborn pretension of the dog. The large dog, so much lazier, so much more weighed upon with matter, so majestic in repose, so beautiful in effort, is born with the dramatic means to wholly represent the part. And it is more pathetic, and perhaps more instructive, to consider the small dog, in his conscientious and imperfect efforts to outdo Sir Philip Sidney. For the ideal of the dog is feudal and religious. The ever-present polytheism, the whip-bearing Olympus of mankind, rules them on the one hand. On the other, their singular difference of size and strength among themselves effectually prevents the appearance of the democratic notion. Or we might more exactly compare their society to the curious spectacle presented by a school. Ushers, monitors, and big and little boys, qualified by one circumstance, the introduction of the other sex. In each we should observe a somewhat similar tension of manner and somewhat similar points of honour. In each the larger animal keeps a contemptuous good humour. In each the smaller annoys him with wasp-like impudence, certain of practical immunity. In each we shall find a double life producing double characters and an excursive and noisy heroism, combined with a fair amount of practical timidity. I have known dogs, and I have known school heroes, that, set aside the fur, could hardly have been told apart. And if we desire to understand the chivalry of old, we must turn to the school playfields, or the dung-heap where the dogs are trooping. Woman, with the dog, has been long enfranchised. Incessant massacre of female innocence has changed the proportions of the sexes, and perverted their relations. Thus, when we regard the manners of the dog, we see a romantic and monogamous animal, once perhaps as delicate as the cat, at war with impossible conditions. Man has much to answer for, and the part he plays is yet more damnable and parlous than Corin's in the eyes of Touchstone. But his intervention has at least created an imperial situation for the rare surviving ladies. In that society they reign without a rival, conscious queens, and in the only instance of a canine wife-beater that has ever fallen under my notice the criminal was somewhat excused by the circumstances of his story. He is a little, very alert, well-bred, intelligent sky, as black as a hat, with a wet bramble for a nose, and two cairngorms for eyes. 
to the human observer he is decidedly well-looking but to the ladies of his race he seems abhorrent a thorough elaborate gentleman of the plume and sword-knot order he was born with the nice sense of gallantry to women he took at their hands the most outrageous treatment i have heard him bleating like a sheep i have seen him streaming blood and his ear tattered like a regimental banner and yet he would scorn to make reprisals nay more when a human lady upraised the contumelious whip against the very dame who had been so cruelly misusing him my little great heart gave but one hoarse cry and fell upon the tyrant tooth and nail this is the tale of a soul's tragedy after three years of unavailing chivalry he suddenly in one hour threw off the yoke of obligation had he been shakespeare he would then have written troilus and cressida to brand the offending sex but being only a little dog he began to bite them the surprise of the ladies whom he attacked indicated the monstrosity of his offence but he had fairly beaten off his better angel fairly committed moral suicide for almost in the same hour throwing aside the last rags of decency he proceeded to attack the aged also the fact is worth remark showing as it does that ethical laws are common both to dogs and men and that with both a single deliberate violation of the conscience loosens all but while the lamp holds on to burn says the paraphrase the greatest sinner may return i have been cheered to see symptoms of effectual penitence in my sweet ruffian and by the handling that he accepted uncomplainingly the other day from an indignant fair one i begin to hope the period of sturm und drang is closed all these little gentlemen are subtle casuists the duty to the female dog is plain but where competing duties rise down they will sit and study them out like jesuit confessors i knew another little sky somewhat plain in manner and appearance but a creature compact of amiability and solid wisdom his family going abroad for a winter he was received for that period by an uncle in the same city the winter over his own family home again and his own house of which he was very proud reopened he found himself in a dilemma between two conflicting duties of loyalty and gratitude his old friends were not to be neglected but it seemed hardly decent to desert the new this was how he solved the problem every morning as soon as the door was opened off posted Kulin to his uncle's visited the children in the nursery saluted the whole family and was back at home in time for breakfast and his bit of fish nor was this done without a sacrifice on his part sharply felt for he had to forego the particular honour and jewel of his day his morning's walk with my father 
and perhaps from this cause he gradually wearied of and relaxed the practice and at length returned entirely to his ancient habits but the same decision served him in another and more distressing case of divided duty which happened not long after he was not at all a kitchen dog but the cook had nursed him with unusual kindness during the distemper and though he did not adore her as he adored my father although born snob he was critically conscious of her position as only a servant he still cherished for her a special gratitude well the cook left and retired some streets away to lodgings of her own and there was Coolin in precisely the same situation with any young gentleman who has had the inestimable benefit of a faithful nurse the canine conscience did not solve the problem with a pound of tea at christmas no longer content to pay a flying visit it was the whole forenoon that he dedicated to his solitary friend and so day by day he continued to comfort her solitude until for some reason which i could never understand and cannot approve he was kept locked up to break him of the graceful habit here it is not the similarity it is the difference that is worthy of remark the clearly marked degrees of gratitude and the proportional duration of his visits anything further removed from instinct it were hard to fancy and one is even stirred to a certain impatience with a character so destitute of spontaneity so passionless in justice and so priggishly obedient to the voice of reason there are not many dogs like this good coolin and not many people but the type is one well marked both in the human and the canine family gallantry was not his aim but a solid and somewhat oppressive respectability he was a sworn foe to the unusual and the conspicuous a praiser of the golden mean a kind of city uncle modified by cheerable and as he was precise and conscientious in all the steps of his own blameless course he looked for the same precision and an even greater gravity in the bearing of his deity my father it was no sinecure to be coolin's idol he was exacting like a rigid parent and at every sign of levity in the man whom he respected he announced loudly the death of virtue and the proximate fall of the pillars of the earth i have called him a snob but all dogs are so though in varying degrees it is hard to follow their snobbery among themselves for though i think we can perceive distinctions of rank we cannot grasp what is the criterion thus in edinburgh in a good part of the town there were several distinct societies or clubs that met in the morning to the phrase is technical to rake the buckets in a troop a friend of mine the master of three dogs was one day surprised to observe that they had left one club and joined another but whether it was a rise or a fall 
and the result of an invitation or an expulsion was more than he could guess and this illustrates pointedly our ignorance of the real life of dogs their social ambitions and their social hierarchies at least in their dealings with men they are not only conscious of sex but of the difference of station and that in the most snobbish manner for the poor man's dog is not offended by the notice of the rich and keeps all his ugly feeling for those poorer or more ragged than his master and again for every station they have an ideal of behaviour to which the master under pain of derogation will do wisely to conform how often has not a cold glance of an eye informed me that my dog was disappointed and how much more gladly would he not have taken a beating than to be thus wounded in the seat of piety i knew one disrespectable dog he was far liker a cat cared little or nothing for men with whom he merely coexisted as we do with cattle and was entirely devoted to the art of poaching a house would not hold him and to live in a town was what he refused he led i believe a life of troubled but genuine pleasure and perished beyond all question in a trap but this was an exception a marked reversion to the ancestral type like the hairy human infant the true dog of the nineteenth century to judge by the remainder of my fairly large acquaintance is in love with respectability a street dog was once adopted by a lady while still an arab he had done as arabs do gambling in the mud charging into butchers stalls a cat hunter a sturdy beggar a common rogue and vagabond but with his rise into society he laid aside these inconsistent pleasures he stole no more he hunted no more cats and conscious of his collar he ignored his old companions yet the canine upper class was never brought to recognize the upstart and from that hour except for human countenance he was alone friendless shorn of his sports and the habits of a lifetime he still lived in a glory of happiness content with his acquired respectability and with no care but to support it solemnly are we to condemn or praise this self-made dog we praise his human brother and thus to conquer vicious habits is as rare with dogs as with men with the more part for all their scruple-mongering and moral thought the vices that are born with them remain invincible throughout and they live all their years glorying in their virtues but still the slaves of their defects thus the sage coolin was a thief to the last among a thousand peccadilloes a whole goose and a whole cold leg of mutton lay upon his conscience but wogs whose souls shipwreck in the matter of gallantry i have recounted above has only twice been known to steal and has often nobly conquered the temptation the eighth is his favourite commandment 
there is something painfully human in these unequal virtues and mortal frailties of the best still more painful is the bearing of those stammering professors in the house of sickness and under the terror of death it is beyond a doubt to me that somehow or other the dog connects together or confounds the uneasiness of sickness and the consciousness of guilt to the pains of the body he often adds the tortures of the conscience and at these times his haggard protestations form in regard to the human deathbed a dreadful parody or parallel i once supposed that i had found an inverse relation between the double etiquette which dogs obey and that those who were most addicted to the showy street life among other dogs were less careful in the practice of home virtues for the tyrant man but the female dog that mass of carnying affectations shines equally in either sphere rules her rough posse of attendant swains with unwearying tact and gusto and with her master and mistress pushes the arts of insinuation to their crowning point the attention of man and the regard of other dogs flatter it would thus appear the same sensibility but perhaps if we could read the canine heart they would be found to flatter it in very marked degrees dogs live with man as courtiers round a monarch steeped in the flattery of his notice and enriched with sinecures to push their favour in this world of pickings and caresses is perhaps the business of their lives and their joys may lie outside i am in despair at our persistent ignorance i read in the lives of our companions the same processes of reason the same antique and fatal conflicts of the right against the wrong and of unbitted nature with too rigid custom i see them with our weaknesses vain false inconstant against appetite and with our one stalk of virtue devoted to the dream of an ideal and yet as they hurry by me on the street with tail in air or come singly to solicit my regard i must own the secret purport of their lives is still inscrutable to man is man the friend or is he the patron only have they indeed forgotten nature's voice or are those moments snatched from courtiership when they touch noses with the tinker's mongrel the brief reward and pleasure of their artificial lives doubtless when man shares with his dog the toils of a profession and the pleasures of an art as with the shepherd or the poacher the affection warms and strengthens till it fills the soul but doubtless also the masters are in many cases the object of a merely interested cultus sitting aloft like louis quatorze giving and receiving flattery and favour and the dogs like the majority of men have but forgotten their true existence and become the dupes of their ambition.
End of section 7 Recording by Section 8 of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson Section 8 A College Magazine 1 all through my boyhood and youth i was known and pointed out for the pattern of an idler and yet i was always busy on my own private end which was to learn to write i kept always two books in my pocket one to read one to write in as i walked my mind was busy fitting what I saw with appropriate words. When I sat by the roadside, I would either read, or a pencil and a penny version book would be in my hand, to note down the features of the scene, or commemorate some halting stanzas. Thus I lived with words and what I thus wrote was for no ulterior use. It was written consciously for practice. It was not so much that I wished to be an author, though I wished that too, as that I had vowed that I would learn to write. That was a proficiency that tempted me, and I practised to acquire it as men learn to whittle in a wager with myself. Description was the principal field of my exercise, for to any one with senses there is always something worth describing, and town and country are but one continuous subject. But I worked in other ways also often accompanied my walks with dramatic dialogues in which i played many parts and often exercised myself in writing down conversations from memory this was all excellent no doubt so were the diaries i sometimes tried to keep but always and very speedily discarded finding them a school of posturing and melancholy self-deception. And yet this was not the most efficient part of my training. Good though it was, it only taught me, so far as I have learned them at all, the lower and less intellectual elements of the art, the choice of the essential note and the right word things that to a happier constitution had perhaps come by nature. And regarded as training, it had one grave defect, for it set me no standard of achievement. So that there was perhaps more profit, as there was certainly more effort, in my secret labours at home. Whenever I read a book or a passage that particularly pleased me, in which a thing was said or an effect rendered with propriety, in which there was either some conspicuous force or some happy distinction in the style, I must sit down at once and set myself to ape that quality. I was unsuccessful and I knew it, and tried again, and was again unsuccessful, and always unsuccessful, but at least in these vain bouts I got some practice in rhythm, in harmony, in construction, and the coordination of parts. 
I have thus played the sedulous ape to Hazlitt, to Lamb, to Wordsworth, to Sir Thomas Brown, to Defoe, to Hawthorne, to Montaigne, to Baudelaire, and to Obermann. I remember one of these monkey tricks, which was called the vanity of morals. It was to have had a second part, the vanity of knowledge. And as I had neither morality nor scholarship, the names were apt. But the second part was never attempted, and the first part was written, which is my reason for recalling it ghost-like from its ashes, no less than three times first in the manner of Hazlitt, second in the manner of Ruskin, who had cast on me a passing spell, and third in a laborious pasticcio of Sir Thomas Brown. So with my other works, Cain, an epic, was, save the mark, an imitation of Sordello, Robin Hood, a tale in verse, took an eclectic middle course among the fields of Keats, Chaucer, and Morris. In Monmouth, a tragedy, I reclined on the bosom of Mr. Swinburne. In my innumerable gouty-footed lyrics I followed many masters. In the first draft of The King's Pardon, a tragedy, I was on the trail of no lesser man than John Webster. In the second draft of the same piece, with staggering versatility, I had shifted my allegiance to Congreve, and of course conceived my fable in a less serious vein for it was not Congreve's verse, it was his exquisite prose that I admired and sought to copy. Even at the age of thirteen I had tried to do justice to the inhabitants of the famous city of Peebles in the style of the Book of Snobs. So I might go on for ever through all my abortive novels, and down to my later plays, of which I think more tenderly, for they were not only conceived at first under the bracing influence of old Dumas, but have met with resurrections. One, strangely bettered by another hand, came on the stage itself, and was played by bodily actors. The other, originally known as Semiramis, a tragedy, I have observed on bookstalls under the alias of Prince Otto. But enough has been said to show by what arts of impersonation, and in what purely ventriloquial efforts, I first saw my words on paper. That, like it or not, is the way to learn to write. Whether I have profited or not, that is the way. It was so Keats learned, and there was never a finer temperament for literature than Keats's. It was so, if we could trace it out, that all men have learned, and that is why a revival of letters is always accompanied or heralded by a cast back to earlier and fresher models. Perhaps I hear someone cry out, but this is not the way to be original. It is not, nor is there any way but to be born so nor yet if you are born original is there anything in this training that shall clip the wings of your originality there can be none more original than montaigne 
neither could any be more unlike cicero yet no craftsman can fail to see how much the one must have tried in his time to imitate the other burns is the very type of a prime force in letters he was of all men the most imitative shakespeare himself the imperial proceeds directly from a school it is only from a school that we can expect to have good writers it is almost invariably from a school that great writers these lawless exceptions issue nor is there anything here that should astonish the considerate before he can tell what cadences he truly prefers the student should have tried all that are possible before he can choose and preserve a fitting key of words he should long have practised the literary scales and it is only after years of such gymnastic that he can sit down at last legions of words swarming to his call dozens of turns of phrase simultaneously bidding for his choice and he himself knowing what he wants to do and within the narrow limit of a man's ability able to do it and it is the great point of these imitations that there still shines beyond the student's reach his inimitable model let him try as he please he is still sure of failure and it is a very old and a very true saying that failure is only the high road to success i must have had some disposition to learn for i clear-sightedly condemned my own performances i liked doing them indeed but when they were done i could see they were rubbish in consequence i very rarely showed them even to my friends and such friends as i chose to be my confidants i must have chosen well for they had the friendliness to be quite plain with me padding said one another wrote i cannot understand why you do lyrics so badly no more could i thrice i put myself in the way of a more authoritative rebuff by sending a paper to a magazine these were returned and i was not surprised nor even pained if they had not been looked at as like all amateurs i suspected was the case there was no good in repeating the experiment if they had been looked at well then i had not yet learned to write and i must keep on learning and living lastly i had a piece of good fortune which is the occasion of this paper and by which i was able to see my literature in print and to measure experimentally how far i stood from the favour of the public two the speculative society is a body of some antiquity and has counted among its members scott brougham geoffrey horner benjamin constant robert emmet and many a legal and local celebrity besides by an accident variously explained it has its rooms in the very buildings of the university of edinburgh a hall turkey carpeted hung with pictures looking when lighted up at night with fire and candle like some goodly dining-room a passage-like library walled with books in their wire cages 
and a corridor with a fireplace, benches, a table, many prints of famous members, and a mural tablet to the virtues of a former secretary. Here a member can warm himself and loaf and read. Here, in defiance of Senatus' consults, he can smoke. The Senatus looks askance at these privileges, looks even with a somewhat vinegar aspect on the whole society, which argues a lack of proportion in the learned mind, for the world, we may be sure, will prize far higher this haunt of dead lions than all the living dogs of the professorate. I sat one December morning in the library of the speculative. A very humble-minded youth, though it was a virtue I never had much credit for, yet proud of my privileges as a member of the spec proud of the pipe I was smoking in the teeth of the Senatus, and in particular proud of being in the next room to three very distinguished students, who were then conversing beside the corridor fire. One of these has now his name on the back of several volumes, and his voice, I learn, is influential in the law courts. Of the death of the second, you have just been reading what I had to say. And the third also has escaped out of that battle of life in which he fought so hard, it may be so unwisely. They were all three, as I have said, notable students, but this was the most conspicuous. Wealthy handsome, ambitious, adventurous, diplomatic, a reader of Balzac, and of all men that I have known, the most like to one of Balzac's characters, he led a life, and was attended by an ill fortune, that could be properly set forth only in the Comédie Humaine. He had then his eye on Parliament, and soon after the time of which I write, he made a showy speech at a political dinner, was cried up to heaven the next day in the current, and the day after he was dashed lower than earth with a charge of plagiarism in the Scotsman. Report would have it, I dare say very wrongly, that he was betrayed by one in whom he particularly trusted, and that the author of the charge had learned its truth from his own lips. Thus at least he was up one day on a pinnacle, admired and envied by all, and the next, though still but a boy, he was publicly disgraced. The blow would have broken a less finely tempered spirit, and even him I suppose it rendered reckless, for he took flight to London, and there, in a fast club, disposed of the bulk of his considerable patrimony in the space of one winter. For years thereafter he lived I know not how always well-dressed, always in good hotels and good society, always with empty pockets. The charm of his manner may have stood him in good stead, but though my own manners are very agreeable, I have never found in them a source of livelihood, and to explain the miracle of his continued existence I must fall back on the theory of the philosopher, that in his case, as in all of the same kind, there was a suffering relative in the background. From this genteel eclipse he reappeared upon the scene, 
and presently sought me out in the character of a generous editor. It is in this part that I best remember him. Tall, slender, with a not ungraceful stoop, looking quite like a refined gentleman, and quite like an urbane adventurer, smiling with an engaging ambiguity, cocking at you one peaked eyebrow with a great appearance of finesse, speaking low and sweet and thick with a touch of burr, telling strange tales with singular deliberation, and to a patient listener excellent effect. After all these ups and downs, he seemed still, like the rich student that he was of yore, to breathe of money seemed still perfectly sure of himself and certain of his end yet he was then upon the brink of his last overthrow he had set himself to found the strangest thing in our society one of those periodical sheets from which men suppose themselves to learn opinions in which young gentlemen from the universities are encouraged at so much a line to garble facts, insult foreign nations, and calumniate private individuals, and which are now the source of glory, so that if a man's name be often enough printed there, he becomes a kind of demigod and people will pardon him when he talks back and forth, as they do for Mr. Gladstone, and crowd him to suffocation on railway platforms, as they did the other day to General Boulanger, and buy his literary works, as I hope you have just done for me. Our fathers, when they were upon some great enterprise, would sacrifice a life, building, it may be, a favourite slave into the foundations of their palace. It was with his own life that my companion disarmed the envy of the gods. He fought his paper single-handed, trusting no one for he was something of a cynic, up early and down late, for he was nothing of a sluggard, daily earwigging influential men, for he was a master of ingratiation. In that slender and silken fellow there must have been a rare vein of courage that he should thus have died at his employment and doubtless ambition spoke loudly in his ear, and doubtless love also, for it seems there was a marriage in his view, had he succeeded. But he died, and his paper died after him, and of all this grace and tact and courage it must seem to our blind eyes as if there had come literally nothing. These three students sat, as I was saying, in the corridor, under the mural tablet that records the virtues of Machain, the former secretary. We would often smile at that ineloquent memorial, and thought it a poor thing to come into the world at all, and leave no more behind one than Machain. And yet of these three, two are gone and have left less. And this book, perhaps, when it is old and foxy, and someone picks it up in a corner of a bookshop, and glances through it, smiling at the old, graceless turns of speech, and perhaps for the love of Alma Mater, which may be still extant and flourishing, buys it, 
not without haggling for some pence this book may alone preserve a memory of james walter ferrier and robert glasgow brown their thoughts ran very differently on that december morning they were all on fire with ambition and when they had called me in to them and made me a sharer in their design i too became drunken with pride and hope we were to found a university magazine a pair of little active brothers livingstone by name great skippers on the foot great rubbers of the hands who kept a bookshop over against the university building had been debauched to play the part of publishers we four were to be conjunct editors and what was the main point of the concern to print our own works while by every rule of arithmetic that flatterer of credulity the adventure must succeed and bring great profit well well it was a bright vision i went home that morning walking upon air to have been chosen by these three distinguished students was to me the most unspeakable advance it was my first draught of consideration it reconciled me to myself and to my fellow men and as i steered round the railings at the tron i could not withhold my lips from smiling publicly yet in the bottom of my heart i knew that magazine would be a grim fiasco i knew it would not be worth reading i knew even if it were that nobody would read it and i kept wondering how i should be able upon my compact income of twelve pounds per annum payable monthly to meet my share in the expense it was a comfortable thought to me that i had a father the magazine appeared in a yellow cover which was the best part of it for at least it was unassuming it ran four months in undisturbed obscurity and died without a gasp the first number was edited by all four of us with prodigious bustle the second fell principally into the hands of ferrier and me the third i edited alone and it has long been a solemn question who it was that edited the fourth it would perhaps be still more difficult to say who read it poor yellow sheet that looked so hopefully in the livingstone's window poor harmless paper that might have gone to print a shakespeare on and was instead so clumsily defaced with the nonsense and shall i say poor editors i cannot pity myself to whom it was all pure gain it was no news to me but only the wholesome confirmation of my judgment when the magazine struggled into half birth and instantly sickened and subsided into night i had sent a copy to the lady with whom my heart was at that time somewhat engaged and who did all that in her lay to break it and she with some tact passed over the gift and my cherished contributions in silence i will not say that i was pleased at this but i will tell her now 
if by any chance she takes up the work of her former servant that i thought the better of her taste i cleared the decks after this lost engagement had the necessary interview with my father which passed off not amiss paid over my share of the expense to the two little active brothers who rubbed their hands as much but methought skipped rather less than formerly having perhaps these two also embarked upon the enterprise with some graceful illusions and then reviewing the whole episode i told myself that the time was not yet ripe nor the man ready and to work i went again with my penny version books having fallen back in one day from the printed author to the manuscript student three from this defunct periodical i am going to reprint one of my own papers the poor little piece is all tale foremost i have done my best to straighten its array i have pruned it fearlessly and it remains invertebrate and wordy no self-respecting magazine would print the thing and here you behold it in a bound volume not for any worth of its own but for the sake of the man whom it purports dimly to represent and some of whose sayings it preserves so that in this volume of memories and portraits robert young the swanston gardener may stand alongside of john todd the swanston shepherd not that john and robert drew very close together in their lives for john was rough he smelt of the windy bray and robert was gentle and smacked of the garden in the hollow perhaps it is to my shame that i liked john the better of the two he had grit and dash and that salt of the old adam that pleases men with any savage inheritance of blood and he was a wayfarer besides and took my gypsy fancy but however that may be and however robert's profile may be blurred in the boyish sketch that follows he was a man of a most quaint and beautiful nature whom if it were possible to recast a piece of work so old i should like well to draw again with a maturer touch and as i think of him and of john i wonder in what other country two such men would be found dwelling together in a hamlet of some twenty cottages in the woody fold of a green hill end of section eight recording by Section 9 of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson Section 9 Books which have influenced me the editor has somewhat insidiously laid a trap for his correspondence the question put appearing at first so innocent truly cutting so deep it is not indeed until after some reconnaissance and review that the writer awakes to find himself engaged upon something in the nature of 
autobiography or perhaps worse upon a chapter in the life of that little beautiful brother whom we once all had and whom we have all lost and mourned the man we ought to have been the man we hoped to be but when word has been passed even to an editor it should if possible be kept and if sometimes i am wise and say too little and sometimes weak and say too much the blame must lie at the door of the person who entrapped me the most influential books and the truest in their influence are works of fiction they do not pin the reader to a dogma which he must afterwards discover to be inexact they do not teach him a lesson which he must afterwards unlearn they repeat they rearrange they clarify the lessons of life they disengage us from ourselves they constrain us to the acquaintance of others and they show us the web of experience not as we can see it for ourselves but with a singular change that monstrous consuming ego of ours being for the nonce struck out to be so they must be reasonably true to the human comedy and any work that is so serves the turn of instruction but the course of our education is answered best by those poems and romances where we breathe a magnanimous atmosphere of thought and meet generous and pious characters shakespeare has served me best few living friends have had upon me an influence so strong for good as hamlet or rosalind the last character already well beloved in the reading i had the good fortune to see i must think in an impressionable hour played by mistress scott siddons nothing has ever more moved more delighted more refreshed me nor has the influence quite passed away kent's brief speech over the dying lear had a great effect upon my mind and was the burthen of my reflections for long so profoundly so touchingly generous did it appear in sense so overpowering in expression perhaps my dearest and best friend outside of shakespeare is d'artagnan the elderly d'artagnan of the vicomte de bragelonne i know not a more human soul nor in his way a finer i shall be very sorry for the man who is so much of a pedant in morals that he cannot learn from the captain of musketeers lastly i must name the pilgrim's progress a book that breathes of every beautiful and valuable emotion but of works of art little can be said their influence is profound and silent like the influence of nature they mould by contact we drink them up like water and are bettered yet know not how it is in books more specifically didactic that we can follow out the effect and distinguish and weigh and compare a book which has been very influential upon me fell early into my hands and so may stand first 
though I think its influence was only sensible later on, and perhaps still keeps growing, for it is a book not easily outlived, the Essay of Montaigne. That temperate and genial picture of life is a great gift to place in the hands of persons of to-day. They will find in these smiling pages a magazine of heroism and wisdom, all of an antique strain. They will have their linen decencies and excited orthodoxies fluttered, and will, if they have any gift of reading, perceive that these have not been fluttered without some excuse and ground of reason. And, again, if they have any gift of reading, they will end by seeing that this old gentleman was in a dozen ways a finer fellow, and held in a dozen ways a nobler view of life than they or their contemporaries. The next book, in order of time, to influence me, was the New Testament, and in particular the Gospel according to St. Matthew. I believe it would startle and move any one if they could make a certain effort of imagination and read it freshly like a book, not droningly and dully like a portion of the Bible. Any one would then be able to see in it those truths which we are all courteously supposed to know and all modestly refrain from applying. But upon this subject it is perhaps better to be silent. I come next to Whitman's Leaves of Grass, a book of singular service, a book which tumbled the world upside down for me blew into space a thousand cobwebs of genteel and ethical illusion, and having thus shaken my tabernacle of lies, set me back again upon a strong foundation of all the original and manly virtues. But it is, once more, only a book for those who have the gift of reading. I will be very frank. I believe it is so with all good books, except perhaps fiction. The average man lives, and must live, so wholly in convention, that gunpowder charges of the truth are more apt to discompose than to invigorate his creed. Either he cries out upon blasphemy and indecency, and crouches the closer round that little idol of part truths and part conveniences, which is the contemporary deity, or he is convinced by what is new, forgets what is old, and becomes truly blasphemous and indecent himself. New truth is only useful to supplement the old. Rough truth is only wanted to expand, not to destroy, our civil and often elegant conventions. He who cannot judge had better stick to fiction and the daily papers. There he will get little harm and in the first, at least, some good. Close upon the back of my discovery of Whitman, I came under the influence of Herbert Spencer. No more persuasive rabbi exists. How much of his vast structure will bear the touch of time, how much is clay, and how much brass, it were too curious to inquire. But his words, if dry, 
are always manly and honest there dwells in his pages a spirit of highly abstract joy plucked naked like an algebraic symbol but still joyful and the reader will find there a caput mortuum of piety with little indeed of its loveliness but with most of its essentials and these two qualities make him a wholesome as his intellectual vigour makes him a bracing writer i should be much of a hound if i lost my gratitude to herbert spencer goethe's life by lewis had a great importance for me when it first fell into my hands a strange instance of the partiality of man's good and man's evil i know no one whom i less admire than goethe he seems a very epitome of the sins of genius breaking open the doors of private life and wantonly wounding friends in that crowning offence of werther and in his own character a mere pen and ink napoleon conscious of the rights and duties of superior talents as a spanish inquisitor was conscious of the rights and duties of his office and yet in his fine devotion to his art in his honest and serviceable friendship for schiller what lessons are contained biography usually so false to its office does here for once perform for us some of the work of fiction reminding us that is of the truly mingled tissue of man's nature and how huge faults and shining virtues cohabit and persevere in the same character history serves as well to this effect but in the originals not in the pages of the popular epitomizer who is bound by the very nature of his task to make us feel the difference of epochs instead of the essential identity of man and even in the originals only to those who can recognise their own human virtues and defects in strange forms often inverted and under strange names often interchanged martial is a poet of no good repute and it gives a man new thoughts to read his works dispassionately and find in this unseemly jester's serious passages the image of a kind wise and self-respecting gentleman it is customary i suppose in reading martial to leave out these pleasant verses i never heard of them at least until i found them for myself and this partiality is one among a thousand things that help to build up our distorted and hysterical conception of the great roman empire this brings us by a natural transition to a very noble book the meditations of marcus aurelius the dispassionate gravity the noble forgetfulness of self the tenderness of others that are there expressed and were practised on so great a scale in the life of its writer make this book a book quite by itself no one can read it and not be moved yet it scarcely or rarely appeals to the feelings those very mobile those not very trusty parts of man 
its address lies further back its lesson comes more deeply home when you have read you carry away with you a memory of the man himself it is as though you had touched a loyal hand looked into brave eyes and made a noble friend there is another bond on you thenceforward binding you to life and to the love of virtue wordsworth should perhaps come next every one has been influenced by wordsworth and it is hard to tell precisely how a certain innocence a rugged austerity of joy a night of the stars the silence that is in the lonely hills something of the cold thrill of dawn cling to his work and give it a particular address to what is best in us i do not know that you learn a lesson you need not mill did not agree with any one of his beliefs and yet the spell is cast such are the best teachers a dogma learned is only a new error the old one was perhaps as good but a spirit communicated is a perpetual possession these best teachers climb beyond teaching to the plane of art it is themselves and what is best in themselves that they communicate i should never forgive myself if i forgot the egoist it is art if you like but it belongs purely to didactic art and from all the novels i have read and i have read thousands stands in a place by itself here is a nathan for the modern david here is a book to send the blood into men's faces satire the angry picture of human faults is not great art we can all be angry with our neighbour what we want is to be shown not his defects of which we are too conscious but his merits to which we are too blind and the egoist is a satire so much must be allowed but it is a satire of a singular quality which tells you nothing of that obvious moat which is engaged from first to last with that invisible beam it is yourself that is hunted down these are your own faults that are dragged into the day and numbered with lingering relish with cruel cunning and precision a young friend of mr meredith's as i have the story came to him in an agony this is too bad of you he cried willoughby is me no my dear fellow said the author he is all of us i have read the egoist five or six times myself and i mean to read it again for i am like the young friend of the anecdote i think willoughby an unmanly but a very serviceable exposure of myself i suppose when i am done i shall find that i have forgotten much that was most influential as i see already i have forgotten thorough and hazlitt whose paper on the spirit of obligations was a turning point in my life and pen whose little book of aphorisms had a brief but strong effect on me and mitford's tales of old japan 
wherein I learned for the first time the proper attitude of any rational man to his country's laws a secret found and kept in the asiatic islands that i should commemorate all is more than i can hope or the editor could ask it will be more to the point after having said so much upon improving books to say a word or two about the improvable reader the gift of reading as i have called it is not very common nor very generally understood it consists first of all in a vast intellectual endowment a free grace i find i must call it by which a man rises to understand that he is not punctually right nor those from whom he differs absolutely wrong he may hold dogmas he may hold them passionately and he may know that others hold them but coldly or hold them differently or hold them not at all well if he has the gift of reading these others will be full of meat for him they will see the other side of propositions and the other side of virtues he need not change his dogma for that but he may change his reading of that dogma and he must supplement and correct his deductions from it a human truth which is always very much a lie hides as much of life as it displays it is men who hold another truth or as it seems to us perhaps a dangerous lie who can extend our restricted field of knowledge and rouse our drowsy consciences something that seems quite new or that seems insolently false or very dangerous is the test of a reader if he tries to see what it means what truth excuses it he has the gift and let him read if he is merely hurt or offended or exclaims upon his author's folly he had better take to the daily papers he will never be a reader and here with the aptest illustrative force after i have laid down my part truth i must step in with its opposite for after all we are vessels of a very limited content not all men can read all books it is only in a chosen few that any man will find his appointed food and the fittest lessons are the most palatable and make themselves welcome to the mind a writer learns this early and it is his chief support he goes on unafraid laying down the law and he is sure at heart that most of what he says is demonstrably false and much of a mingled strain and some hurtful and very little good for service but he is sure besides that when his words fall into the hands of any genuine reader they will be weighed and winnowed and only that which suits will be assimilated and when they fall into the hands of one who cannot intelligently read they come there quite silent and inarticulate falling upon deaf ears and his secret is kept as if he had not written
Section 10 of Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen Essays of Robert Louis Stevenson Section 10 Pulvis et Umbra Dust and Shadow we look for some reward of our endeavours, and are disappointed. Not success, not happiness, not even peace of conscience, crowns our ineffectual efforts to do well. Our frailties are invincible, our virtues barren. The battle goes sore against us to the going down of the sun. The canting moralist tells us of right and wrong, and we look abroad, even on the face of our small earth, and find them change with every climate, and no country where some action is not honoured for a virtue and none where it is not branded for a vice. And we look in our experience, and find no vital congruity in the wisest rules, but at the best a municipal fitness. It is not strange if we are tempted to despair of good. We ask too much our religions and moralities have been trimmed to flatter us till they are all emasculate and sentimentalized and only please and weaken truth is of a rougher strain in the harsh face of life faith can read a bracing gospel the human race is a thing more ancient than the Ten Commandments, and the bones and revolutions of the cosmos, in whose joints we are but moss and fungus, more ancient still. 1. Of the cosmos, in the last resort, science reports many doubtful things and all of them appalling there seems no substance to this solid globe on which we stamp nothing but symbols and ratios symbols and ratios carry us and bring us forth and beat us down gravity that swings the incommensurable suns and worlds through space is but a figment varying inversely as the squares of distances and the suns and worlds themselves imponderable figures of abstraction n h three and h two o consideration dares not dwell upon this view that way madness lies science carries us into zones of speculation where there is no habitable city for the mind of man but take the cosmos with a grosser faith as our senses give it to us we behold space sown with rotatory islands suns and worlds and the shards and wrecks of systems some like the sun still blazing some rotting like the earth others like the moon stable in desolation all of these we take to be made of something we call matter a thing which no analysis can help us to conceive, to whose incredible properties no familiarity can reconcile our minds. This stuff, 
when not purified by the lustration of fire, rots uncleanly into something we call life, seized through all its atoms with a pediculous malady, swelling in tumours that become independent, sometimes even, by an abhorrent prodigy, locomotory one splitting into millions millions cohering into one as the malady proceeds through varying stages this vital putrescence of the dust used as we are to it yet strikes us with occasional disgust and the profusion of worms in a piece of ancient turf, or the air of a marsh darkened with insects, will sometimes check our breathing, so that we aspire for cleaner places. But none is clean. The moving sand is infected with lice, the pure spring where it bursts out of the mountain, is a mere issue of worms. Even in the hard rock the crystal is forming. In two main shapes this eruption covers the countenance of the earth, the animal and the vegetable, one in some degree the inversion of the other the second rooted to the spot, the first coming detached out of its natal mud, and scurrying abroad with the myriad feet of insects, or towering into the heavens on the wings of birds, a thing so inconceivable that, if it be well considered, the heart stops. To what passes with the anchored vermin we have little clue. Doubtless they have their joys and sorrows, their delights and killing agonies. It appears not how. But of the locomotory, to which we ourselves belong, we can tell more. These share with us a thousand miracles the miracles of sight, of hearing, of the projection of sound, things that bridge space, the miracles of memory and reason, by which the present is conceived, and when it is gone, its image kept living in the brains of man and brute, the miracle of reproduction, with its imperious desires and staggering consequences. And to put the last touch upon this mountain mass of the revolting and the inconceivable, all these prey upon each other, lives tearing other lives in pieces, cramming them inside themselves, and by that summary process growing fat. The vegetarian, the whale, perhaps the tree, not less than the lion of the desert, for the vegetarian is only the eater of the dumb. Meanwhile our rotary island, loaded with predatory life, and more drenched with blood, both animal and vegetable, than ever mutinied ship, scuds through space with unimaginable speed, and turns alternate cheeks to the reverberation of a blazing world ninety million miles away. 2 what a monstrous spectre is this man the disease of the agglutinated dust lifting alternate feet 
or lying drugged with slumber killing feeding growing bringing forth small copies of himself grown upon with hair like grass fitted with eyes that move and glitter in his face a thing to set children screaming and yet looked at nearlier known as his fellows know him how surprising are his attributes poor soul here for so little cast among so many hardships filled with desires so incommensurate and so inconsistent savagely surrounded savagely descended irremediably condemned to prey upon his fellow lives who should have blamed him had he been of a piece with his destiny and a being merely barbarous and we look and behold him instead filled with imperfect virtues infinitely childish often admirably valiant often touchingly kind sitting down amidst his momentary life to debate of right and wrong and the attributes of the deity rising up to do battle for an egg or die for an idea singling out his friends and his mate with cordial affection bringing forth in pain rearing with long-suffering solicitude his young to touch the heart of his mystery we find in him one thought strange to the point of lunacy the thought of duty the thought of something owing to himself to his neighbour to his god an ideal of decency to which he would rise if it were possible a limit of shame below which if it be possible he will not stoop the design in most men is one of conformity here and there in picked natures it transcends itself and soars on the other side arming martyrs with independence but in all in their degrees it is a bosom thought not in man alone for we trace it in dogs and cats whom we know fairly well and doubtless some similar point of honour sways the elephant the oyster and the louse of whom we know so little but in man at least it sways with so complete an empire that merely selfish things come second even with the selfish that appetites are starved fears are conquered pains supported that almost the dullest shrinks from the reproof of a glance although it were a child's and all but the most cowardly stand amid the risks of war and the more noble having strongly conceived an act as due to their ideal affront and embrace death strange enough if with their singular origin and perverted practice they think they are to be rewarded in some future life stranger still if they are persuaded of the contrary and think this blow which they solicit will strike them senseless for eternity i shall be reminded what a tragedy of misconception and misconduct man at large presents of organised injustice 
cowardly violence and treacherous crime and of the damning imperfections of the best they cannot be too darkly drawn man is indeed marked for failure in his efforts to do right but where the best consistently miscarry how tenfold more remarkable that all should continue to strive and surely we should find it both touching and inspiriting that in a field from which success is banished our race should not cease to labour if the first view of this creature stalking in his rotatory isle be a thing to shake the courage of the stoutest on this nearer sight he startles us with an admiring wonder it matters not where we look under what climate we observe him in what stage of society in what depth of ignorance burthened with what erroneous morality by camp-fires in assiniboia the snow powdering his shoulders the wind plucking his blanket as he sits passing the ceremonial calumet and uttering his grave opinions like a roman senator in ships at sea a man inured to hardship and vile pleasures his brightest hope a fiddle in a tavern and a bedizened trull who sells herself to rob him and he for all that simple innocent cheerful kindly like a child constant to toil brave to drown for others in the slums of cities moving among indifferent millions to mechanical employments without hope of change in the future with scarce a pleasure in the present and yet true to his virtues honest up to his lights kind to his neighbours tempted perhaps in vain by the bright gin palace perhaps long-suffering with the drunken wife that ruins him in india a woman this time kneeling with broken cries and streaming tears as she drowns her child in the sacred river in the brothel the discard of society living mainly on strong drink fed with affronts a fool a thief the comrade of thieves and even here keeping the point of honour and the touch of pity often repaying the world's scorn with service often standing firm upon a scruple and at a certain cost rejecting riches everywhere some virtue cherished or affected everywhere some decency of thought and carriage everywhere the ensign of man's ineffectual goodness ah oh, if i could show you this if i could show you these men and women all the world over in every stage of history under every abuse of error under every circumstance of failure without hope without help without thanks still obscurely fighting the lost fight of virtue still clinging in the brothel or on the scaffold to some rag of honour the poor jewel of their souls they may seek to escape and yet they cannot 
it is not alone their privilege and glory but their doom they are condemned to some nobility all their lives long the desire of good is at their heels the implacable hunter of all earth's meteors here at least is the most strange and consoling that this ennobled lemur this hair-crowned bubble of the dust this inheritor of a few years and sorrows should yet deny himself his rare delights and add to his frequent pains and live for an ideal however misconceived nor can we stop with man a new doctrine received with screams a little while ago by canting moralists and still not properly worked into the body of our thoughts lights us a step farther into the heart of this rough but noble universe for nowadays the pride of man denies in vain his kinship with the original dust he stands no longer like a thing apart close at his heels we see the dog prince of another genius and in him too we see dumbly testified the same cultus of an unattainable ideal the same constancy in failure does it stop with the dog we look at our feet where the ground is blackened with the swarming ant a creature so small so far from us in the hierarchy of brutes that we can scarce trace and scarce comprehend his doings and here also in his ordered polities and rigorous justice we see confessed the law of duty and the fact of individual sin does it stop then with the ant rather this desire of well-doing and this doom of frailty run through all the grades of life rather is this earth from the frosty top of everest to the next margin of the internal fire one stage of ineffectual virtues and one temple of pious tears and perseverance the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together it is the common and the godlike law of life the browsers the biters the barkers the hairy coats of field and forest the squirrel in the oak the thousand-footed creeper in the dust as they share with us the gift of life share with us the love of an ideal strive like us like us are tempted to grow weary of the struggle to do well like us receive at times unmerited refreshment visitings of support returns of courage and are condemned like us to be crucified between that double law of the members and the will are they like us i wonder in the timid hope of some reward some sugar with the drug do they too stand aghast at unrewarded virtues at the sufferings of those whom in our partiality we take to be just and the prosperity of such as in our blindness we call wicked it may be and yet god knows what they should look for 
even while they look even while they repent the foot of man treads them by thousands in the dust the yelping hounds burst upon their trail the bullet speeds the knives are heating in the den of the vivisectionist or the dew falls and the generation of a day is blotted out for these are creatures compared with whom our weakness is strength our ignorance wisdom our brief span eternity and as we dwell we living things in our isle of terror and under the imminent hand of death god forbid it should be man the erected the reasoner the wise in his own eyes god forbid it should be man that wearies in well-doing that despairs of unrewarded effort or utters the language of complaint let it be enough for faith that the whole creation groans in mortal frailty strives with unconquerable constancy surely not all in vain End of section 10 Recording by Martin Giessen